make them mad. Seven years. No, I didn't make them mad. Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, April 8, 2014. Uh, regular business meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. If you would all please join me in a pledge of allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Uh, so we will get started. Item one, are there any adjustments to tonight's agenda? Hola. Seeing none, item two, approval of school board minutes. May I please have a motion? I move that we approve the school board minutes from the workshop on Tuesday, March 4th, 2014. Executive session Tuesday, March 11th, 2014. Regular business Tuesday, March 11th, 2014. Workshop Tuesday, March 18th, 2014. Workshop Tuesday, March 25th, 2014. Executive session Thursday, March 27th, 2014. And special business meeting Thursday, March 27th, 2014. Is there a second? Okay. All right. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Zero. All right, item three would be our comments by student representatives, but I don't see our student representatives, so we will move on to item four. Um, comments from the public on agenda items. Uh, if there are members of the public here tonight to speak on on items on our agenda. Uh, now is the time to speak. Would you please approach the podium? Hello, uh, as some of you know, my name is Chris Straw, I live at 597 Shore Road. Uh, I would like to talk about the budget. I assume that falls into the criteria Absolutely. for this evening. Thank you, Chris. Great. Uh, so I have two points that I'd like to focus on. First, uh, just the mindset I believe you should take to this budget process and deciding whether to uh, vote for this budget or changes to make to it. And after that, I'd like to talk about my specific issue with the budget. Uh, I noticed during the workshops that uh, Board Member Hillman uh, would often state that the different issues that you're deciding between the different line items in the budget, it's not an either or between one item or another, and that each item should rise or fall on its own merit. And I think he's absolutely right about that. Each item. You should look at it and say, is this an item we should fund or is this an item where we should perhaps not spend as much on it? If it's the right thing to do, you should simply do it. That's my opinion. Look at the item. Is it worth funding? If so, spend the money on it. And I believe that what we choose to fund says a lot about who we are as a town, who you are as a school board, and our administration. And I should think you should take that into account when you make your decision on the different line items in the budget. What does it say about what, who we are as a town who we are as a school board, who we are as an administration, that we would choose to fund one item versus another. And, I, and now to get a little more particular on the kind of the, the approach I think you should take with this, your decision making, I think we can all agree, or at least I hope we all agree, that the primary goal of the school board, the reason that we're all here, is that we want to make sure that the children of this town have an opportunity to reach their full potential. We want to make sure that they become well-rounded, well-adjusted members of our society. And that, for me, one of the primary items you need to focus on is whether academics are truly paramount to us. What is most important to us? Is it academics or is it extra, extracurricular enrichment? Now, don't get me wrong. I believe extracurricular enrichment is very valuable. I think it absolutely should be part of the budget. But I think, first, the paramount issue needs to be academic performance is each child given the opportunity to reach their full potential academically. And that gets to my primary issue here. Um, as you may recall, during the workshop, I uh, came up and I commended the administration, and they absolutely should be commended for this. Up until this year, we as a school board have failed to meet the state standards for gifted and talented education. We weren't even submitting the required paperwork to the state that we were required to have with this program. And I think we need to think about what, that send, what message that sends people that are considering what town should we settle in. Where, should, where do I want to live 
and what is important to the people of Cape Elizabeth. And I, I, I'm sure some of you know this already, but nevertheless, I'd just like to go over the numbers that some of the other school districts that surround us are spending on gifted and talented education. And this is for last year, because we don't yet have the numbers for the different districts for this year. Falmouth, $157,000. Yarmouth, $107,000. South Portland, $269,000. Scarborough, $233,000. Gorham, $101,000. Westbrook, $146,000. RSU number 14, which is Wyndham and Raymond, $184,000. Cape Elizabeth, $0. Like board, Hill, uh, board member Hillman said, each item should rise and fall on its own. Do we believe that all children in our district should be given the opportunity to reach their full potential? Or, as we're doing right now, do we want to put up a keep out, you're not wanted sign? Because if I have a child that I believe, and I don't even know if my child would even qualify for any of this funding, what I'm focusing on is what we should be doing as a town, what standards we should be setting for ourselves, what message we want to be sending to the public at large. And the message we're sending right now is if you have a gifted and talented child, Keep out, you're not wanted in Cape Elizabeth. So again, I think the superintendent, the administration should be commended for finally at least getting paperwork in. So we're at least going through the motions. And I realize a program like this, because we haven't been meeting our obligations in the past, may take a little time to get up and running. But you at least need to think about if we're not gonna fund it this year, let's start doing something, something next year. It's great that we're gonna have a consultant for $5,000 or some um, equivalent amount. But when we're spending, I don't remember if it was a sports chiropractic or, some chiropractor or something along those lines for the high school, we're spending something like twenty dollars or $30,000, yet we're not spending any money on gifted and talented education. What message are we sending the rest of Maine? What message are we sending people that are trying to decide what town they should settle in? And is that the message we want to be sending? And keep in mind that at the end of the day, our primary goal is to help these children reach their full potential. Are we doing that? If every item should rise and fall on its own, how can we possibly, with a straight face, not fund gifted and talented education whatsoever in this town? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I Sorry for the formality, suit just came from work, but since I, I did come from work and I am wearing a suit, I brought you a PowerPoint presentation, if that's okay. <laughs> and I approached the, uh, we'll pass those around and follow along with me. Follow up, but Chris was talking about here as well. And it's about gifted and talented as a line item within the budget. I know. So that is, uh, this perspective that I would like to take, and I think it also touches on an agenda item that you have tonight as well on the survey results that you have, and I'll try to be here for that portion of the meeting as well. But the first slide here, and there's some copies for the audience if, if anybody would like a copy to follow along. The, the parents' perspective, I know you'll cover tonight, but in that, on one question, question number eight, about the school doing a good job challenging my child to his or her full potential. 44% were unfavorable or neutral versus the national norm of 30% unfavorable slash neutral. I think this is very telling data. And this is the type of information that shouldn't form the budget process. It shouldn't form the budget process, but this data we're only looking at now at the 11th hour around the budgeting process today. After that, our personal experience as a parent, uh, my wife Liza and I, uh, Liza sent an email last May as he was completing second grade, preparing for third grade where a gift and talents program will typically begin. And we received the response that uh, the plan will be developed last summer. And a good part of Ms. Golding's time would be spent last summer working on this uh, proposal. And we'll have a consultant last summer. So the action in the subsequent 10 months that we're looking at here, in March 2014, nearly 10 months later, uh, my wife emailed with an update on the status of the plan. And the response was, 
here's the plan. It's attached. Thanks for asking. <laughs> right. But it had not been you know, formally released that, that I know that other folks had it, so we're, we're happy to have that. I don't know why it was embargoed from public view, but it clearly was, in my opinion. Uh, and has that plan been implemented in the school year? Because the plan is dated September 23rd of 2013. Some excerpts from the plan. The Cape Elizabeth schools are committed to addressing the academic and social emotional needs of gifted and talented students, grades three through eight. And some very specific characteristics identified and some very specific methodology towards identification of those students. And screening of those students by that methodology. And then the selection committees to meet and blindly review all collected information. The 2014-15 school year is looming. And I don't know if that has happened, was intended to happen, but it clearly hasn't. In follow-up to what Chris has said about this, Cape's peers in gifted and tal talented waiver status, this is the entire list of other school districts that have a waiver from a gifted and talented program. The Cranberry Isle School Department, Frenchboro, Millinocket, Monhegan, MSAD 76, RSU 02, RSU 65, etc. Last meeting that I attended, you know, it was brought to my attention that we have some peer institutions geographically surrounding Cape Elizabeth, including Falmouth, Gorman, Gorham, Portland, Scarborough, South Portland, Yarmouth. The data is here on average $202,000 budgeted uh, by this state generated report for the fiscal year 15 funding. In closing, my, my question is, is this passive process of addressing gifted and talented students th this school board's intention? Is it your intention? And I think that collaboration, debate, information is so important in this way. But it feels like the information, be it a parent survey, the actual GNT plan, and other components. Tonight's budget is not on the website. I don't, I don't understand why that's happening, so we can't have a, a two-way discussion on these topics. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Christopher. Is there anyone else from the public who would like to approach the podium and speak? OK, seeing none, um, we will move on to item five communications and begin with the recognition of our Cape Special Olympics uh, Girls Alpine Class B state champions. Oh, I think we're recognizing our Special Olympians first. Oh, I'm sorry. And Coach Johnson and Coach Croft are here to get us started and they'll be introducing um, one of the athletes who's going to then introduce the team. Hi, good evening. My name is Karen Johnson and this is Dave Croft. We are the um, Cape Olympian coaches and coordinators of the um, Cape, Cape Elizabeth Special Olympic program. The Cape Olympian team competes in Special Olympic, uh, Special Olympic events and tournaments throughout the year. The team is made up of students with disabilities from Pond Cove Middle and the high school. Our goal is to offer the students a meaningful athletic and competitive experience with their peers in sports. We expose them to what it means to be on a team where we schedule practices, encourage sportsmanship, and demonstrate commitment. We are in the middle of developing a unified sports pro component to our program. Unified sports brings together athletes with disabilities and without disabilities to train and compete, on this, and compete together. 
Throughout the year, athletes compete in a variety of sports, including soccer, basketball, golf, bocce ball, and other events. Mommy? Through unified Mommy? sports, athletes will improve their physical fitness, sharpen their motor skills, and improve their social understanding skills while having fun. We recently had a unified team play in the Maine State Special Olympic Basketball Tournament. They earned a bronze medal for their efforts. Here tonight is middle school Cape Olympian Ian Robertson, who will present this year's athletic events and introduce his teammates. My name is Ian Robertson. I'm in the eighth grade. I'm a Cape Olympian, and I competed in Special Olympic events with my team. I'd like you to tell about our season. In the fall, we competed in soccer and bowling. In January, we went to the Sugarloaf Winter Games for two nights, where we competed in cross-country skiing and skating. In March, we had our basketball events and had Olympians who competed in either skill or in games with our unified team. Swimming took place last week with Cumberland County teams. Our last event of the year is track and field. We will attend both of the Cumberland County meet at Bonnie Eagle and the state of meet in Orno. I'd like you to introduce the Cape Olympians. Noren, Nolan Dorrance, Thomas Bordeaux, Jameson Vickery, Madison Mills, Evan Zach, Gabe Brewington, Thatcher Kent, Ethan Powers, Emily Whalen, Cody Spangler, Peter Tarling, Jacob Roberts, Allison Broking, Henry Adams, and me. Ian Robertson. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Yeah, Before you go, I'd just like to thank all of you for uh, representing uh, Cape Elizabeth so well. And you uh, you're truly are Olympians, and I'd like to thank uh, Coach Croft and uh, Coach Johnson for, for the time and uh, the love they show um, the, the students. So thank you for your commitment, and uh, thank you for speaking. Uh, the young man who spoke, you did fantastic. Uh, I could definitely take lessons from you, so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Michael. Thank you. Just pausing for a minute. It makes us proud. Okay, so now we will move along to item 5B, proficiency-based diplomas. And for that, we welcome Jeff Shedd and Ruth Ellen Vaughn. Sure, it only improves with age. There are a couple new slides. Really? I'm excited. I went to the parent presentation the other night.
So this is a slightly revised, slightly enhanced version of a presentation that Ruth Ellen and I did, or the first half of the presentation that Ruth Ellen and I did for parents on April 2nd, which I think might have been last week. Yes, I think it was last week. Um, so you have probably heard the phrase proficiency diplomas. You may have heard the phrase standards-based grading. I don't know what knowledge I can assume. So this really starts at the same place we started with parents. Um, and I hope that it gives you some valuable information and some context. Um, so I don't know why this is going up like that. That's really odd. Uh, I'm not going to worry about it because it's right there. Okay, so what we're going to be doing tonight, um, the first, this is what we're really going to be doing tonight in terms of a presentation as a basic primer on standards, standards-based grading, and proficiency diplomas. Um, what are the standards? We talked to parents a little bit about that. We're going to address that more if board members have questions because we don't want to get folks sort of mired in the weeds of the structure of the Common Core and those sorts of things. Uh, Ruth Allen in particular can certainly point you in the direction of how to find those from the Cape Elizabeth School's website. Um, and then we'll take whatever questions and answers that the board's time provides. So the, this, the purpose of this slide with this um, cute little girl learning to swim or who clearly has learned pretty well how to swim, um, is that standards-based grading is really nothing new. I remember when I had my kids go to the pool at the high school through community services, they took swim lessons. Um, and at the end of a session of swim lessons, we as parents would get back from the swim instructors a card that sort of outlined the skills that it was the aim of the swim instructors to teach our kids uh, during that session and they checked things off. Um, and those things that they checked off were really standards. And really, in many ways, coaching and athletics and sort of pure skill-based things are um, almost ahead of where we are in the, the world of academics in terms of standards-based. But that really is an exemplar of what standards-based education is. Because the idea was that in order to get to the next level, it's important that you master each of those skills that would sort of set you up for success at the next level and not to continue to pass you on if you're lacking some particular skill. Um, so the Red Cross has done a nice job, I'm not going to believe her, this slide of sort of defining. So this is a picture of uh, something is used by Gate Hill Day Camp. Um, it's a version of the Red Cross card. It's their particular version of it. And there's a whole series of checkboxes. Um, and one of which, at the top right, I think, um, is experience wearing a life jacket and putting it on. So that is a standard used to get to, from the level where that child is to the next level um, of education. And of course, the point is that traditionally, the reason I decided to start here is Traditionally, our academic grades express an average of how students are doing. In other words, you get a numerical grade as parents, students get a numerical or a letter grade as that says, this is what the student does, this is where the student is, but that really is a symbol that represents, on average, where the student is. Um, the dilemma if the Red Cross were to adopt a similar approach for teaching swim lessons is if the student doesn't know how to put on a life jacket and yet has mastered each of those other skills, you could throw that kid into the deep end of the pool and the child could drown. Um, so merely saying that a student on average has mastered the skills uh, at the duck level of swimming um, really isn't good enough. It's the idea that they need to master each one of those skills. So what is a standard? Standard is a description. This is not a Merriam-Webster definition or a Ruth Ellen Vaughan Jeff definition or a Jeff Shedd. It is a Jeff Shedd definition. That's what it is. Um, it is a description of what a student should know or be able to do at the end of a unit of study. Whether that unit of study is a unit in a class or it is a, the end of a class in Algebra 1 or it is the end of a sequence of classes in math over four years that lead to graduation. So it's a description of what a student should know or be able to do at the end of a unit of study. So I use an example of physics because we teach physics in ninth grade. Um, and 
there are different kinds of standards within our physics curriculum that are, well, there are dis different kinds of standards that are described related to the general topic of physics that are embedded within Maine's learning results. Um, and one is very course specific things. So for example, one of them, and this I didn't, this is actually not a quote, I was just paraphrasing, that the student will understand and be able to apply Newton's second law to explain the mo movement of objects. I think the second law, roughly, the next sp roughly speaking, and with apologies to Dr. Efron, is something like um, the motion of an object is proportionate to the force that's applied to it. Um, he would probably have a fit if he's watching tonight uh, because I'm sure I've just butchered Newton's second law. But there is a standard in the next gen science standards about Newton's second law and it says something about that. That it's really important that the people who wrote the next gen standards say it's really important for the kids to get through physics but not just on average but to come out with an understanding of Newton's second law in addition to other specific areas that they identify. Interestingly, the Newton's, the next gen science standards don't say anything about Newton's first law or third law. I know that's making Dr. Efron cringe, but it's true. Um, and we do teach that. Um, I just have a quick question. Yeah. You're, you're using interchangeably the next gen standards yep. and Common Core standards. Are they? Common Core are standards that have been adopted by the. Do you want to answer this question? I can. Get your voice on the <laughs> okay. table. Go ahead. Except I'm not that tall. Um, the Maine Learning Results is a set of standards that the state of Maine has adopted as these are our state standards. Within that, they have adopted for ELA, English Language Arts and Math, the Common Core state standards, which were developed by a national consortia. It's what are considered the national standards. Maine has adopted those as their English Language Arts and Math standards. The next gen science standards are, are correlated to both the ELA and math common core standards. They are in the process of adoption for the state of, of Maine. So right now, we have the Maine learning results from 2007 that are still legally on the books and on the state website, along with the next gen, which we are being told is where we are headed. But right now, there have been a few other things that have taken the legislature's time. So they're there, and we are pointed toward them as that's where we're headed. They are, they are again, developed by a national consortia. That is, they are national science standards as well. So next gen is referred to as the common core for science. They're correlated, but they're not technically common core. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so in another level of standard that are defined in the next gen science standards, which are the main learning results in science, or will, soon will, will be. be the main learning results in science, are, court, are standards that are discipline but not court specific. The best example is the ability to think scientifically, to reason scientifically. The best expression of that as embedded in our students' coursework are the ability to, to write lab reports, to think about the error of lab reports, to, think, to, to find patterns within lab reports. Um, so that is a discipline but not course specific standard. So that same standard applies in physics and chemistry and biology and whatever, other, whatever the course sequence is in science. So there is another level of standards that cut across all the disciplines. And those are the things that are the skills that most of us would probably be, agree are the most important things for students to leave middle school, high school with, sort of a deepening understanding of writing and the ability to speak, um, the ability to present, and those other things. So, for example, um, the student will communicate effectively to a wide variety of audiences and in a wide variety of genres. So a lab report written in physics or chemistry or biology would obviously inform how the student is doing as against that standard, but um, the narrative papers that students write in English would also uh, inform how our, our conclusion about how students are doing against that standard. Um, by the way, this in, in Maine's lingo, this level of standard is referred to as the guiding principles. It's not the common core, it's not next gen, 
It's not me. It is part of the main learning results, but it's the big cross-cutting section which have their own title called Guiding Principles. Okay, why the move towards standards? Um, one reason is because standards help students and teachers and parents all understand what a student's specific strengths and weaknesses are at a more granular level than an A would communicate or a 94 would communicate. It says, as against the most important knowledge and skills embedded in courses, which of them are coming easily to students? Have students got? And which of them are, have they not yet got? Um, so it helps parents and students understand where efforts should continue to be placed and where, and help teachers to understand where they need to provide more support to students. Okay, another reason is the Cape Elizabeth mission statement, as you know, um, sets a target to move towards standards within, to standards-based grading specifically within five years. Um, with the work we are doing to move towards standards-based grading is on a more, at the high school anyway, is on a more aggressive time scale, uh, driven by the law, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So the other reason why I move towards standards is to try to develop some sense of consistency across teachers, so that a B actually represents a certain level of achievement, whether you've got Dr. Efron or Dr. Gret, or you know, apply that in all the different courses that are taught in common, the same courses taught by different teachers, and it just gives more of a sense of where those strengths and weaknesses are, as I say. And then the, third, the last bullet point is the sense across the nation that too many students leave high schools unprepared, Unpre not prepared to be successful in college. Um, that is true if you look statistically nationwide. We are lucky because we work in a community where that is less true here. More, a much higher percentage of our students leave high school prepared for college, but there are some kids who do not. Um, so for us as well, that move is, heads us in the right direction and forces us to ask questions in a pretty systematic way that are really important. And the final reason really is that it's the law. Um, the, the legislature actually passed the requirement to move towards proficiency-based diplomas two springs ago, but two springs ago they didn't fund the law, so the, so the implementation of the law was delayed and it was uncertain until late last spring whether in fact it would be funded and would kick in to apply to the class of 2018. Um, in the late spring, I believe the chronology is the legislature passed a law funding um, the state level of support for the move towards proficiency-based diplomas. So starting with the class of 2018, which is this year's eighth graders, um, our ninth graders next year in the high school, those students, according to state law, may not receive diplomas anywhere in the state of Maine from a public high school unless they've demonstrated proficiency against Maine's learning results. Okay, now Joe, this, you, saw, you saw this, this in its infancy, this, but this, these next two slides are new. You haven't seen these, because I thought the board would appreciate under, seeing the language of the law. Um, so, and, and this would also allow you to actually look in case you're interested at the law. So 20 M A MRSA 4722-A, beginning January, 9, 2000, January 1, 2018, a diploma indicating graduation from a secondary school must be based on student demonstration of proficiency. And then the next section, the requirement for the award of a diploma. In order to receive a diploma, according to current state law, a student must demonstrate that the student engaged in educational experience relating to English language arts, mathematics, and science and technology in each year of the student's secondary schooling. The interesting thing about this provision, it doesn't say coursework, it says educational experience, because one of the premises behind the law is that there are different pathways to get to, to proficiency. So this is sort of, language is sort of suggestive of the possibility of different pathways other than formal coursework. B, demonstrate proficiency in meeting state standards in all content areas of the learning results. That is, English, math, those standards are the common core, science, 
Those standards will be the next-gen science standards. They're not quite yet. And then standards in foreign language, social studies, uh, health. health and PE, and the arts, and I think... And the guiding principles. And the guiding principles, sort of those overarching principles. Um. And then demonstrate proficiency in each of the guiding principles. So that's a separate statutory requirement. One of the issues that um, people are trying to understand and figure out how best to implement is the issue about what to do with students with disabilities. Um, and the statutory language is that a child, child with a disability who achieves proficiency is required in the language from the previous slide, as specified by the goals and objectives of the student's individualized education plan, may be awarded a high school diploma. So there's a little bit of fuzzy, fuzzy language there. Um, so part of the statute also empowers the commissioner to sort of take positions about what, the law, what statutory language means. That's not an uncommon provision in, in law. So this is the commissioner's letter um, dated February 13th, 2013. The department interprets this language to mean that an IEP may modify the means by which a student with a disability demonstrates proficiency in the standards, but the IEP does not modify the standards themselves. In other words, it's the same bar that students with IEPs have to get over. They can get over it a little differently or demonstrate it a little differently, but in theory, it's exactly the same law, and unless students with an IEP demonstrate that same level of proficiency against the standards, they also may not be awarded a diploma starting with next year's freshman class across the state of Maine. Hmm. Okay, this is, we've really talked about this. Um, state, land, state standards are at three levels. I've mentioned that. We've distinguished the guiding principles. So how much of a change is this? Did you, did you want to? Doesn't matter. Um, in the past, Diplomas were earned primarily according to Carnegie unit seat time. You've been in this class this long. You've passed the class. Therefore, you get a diploma. Um, it doesn't matter what class that was. So it could have been any number of maths. It could have gone up through calculus. It could have just hit three years of math that got them through Algebra two. As long as it was the required number of math classes, it didn't matter which one. Anything got them there. Now, we can still have different paths, but the standards don't change. Students can certainly exceed the standards, and many of our students will. Mm -hmm. But every student must demonstrate minimal proficiency against these standards, which means at least through functions and statistics at the math level, we need to have kids get further. So, what are the standards? We've just, we've talked about those already, so I'm not going to belabor that one. Um, who determines how good is good enough to meet a standard? Um, it's really the language of the standard as interpreted by a, by a group of teachers here in connection, with, in collaboration with, with Ruth Allen, uh, determine the level of proficiency that's required. That same determination is being made in every school system across the state of Maine. Okay, what that level, what that evidence is that's enough to justify a conclusion that the student has met the standards. It is a local decision. So there is no statewide assessment uh, that will be given, as it is in many states, which determines graduation. You may have heard of an assessment called Smarter Balanced that will be started to be given to students next year. Um, but the way the law is written, the student's results on Smarter Balanced Assessment does not affect uh, the determination of whether they have met proficiency against the learning results. I'm going to avoid editorializing. Right. <laughs> does this mean additional work for teachers? Yes, particularly in keeping track. Um, that's why we plan to take measured steps so that we can do well what we do and not jump in with both feet because we haven't learned how to affix our life jacket securely yet. Um, so we're, we're still working on the ducky stage. Um, the area where we are, sorry, that was an improvisation. The area, 
the area where we are, our current plan is, we will more completely implement a move towards standards-based grading and proficiency diplomas are foreign language and physics. And there are two very different reasons for those two areas. Foreign language, because foreign language for the last couple of years has already been experimenting with standards-based grading, and in fact, they're already organizing their grade books and their reporting of grades very differently. They are actually excited um, about this journey. Um, most people are excited, actually, in concept. It's, it's the details and the logistics. And the second area is physics. Um, and the reason for physics is it is unique in our course offerings in that once students uh, have passed physics in ninth grade, they won't necessarily encounter physics again. They will if they take an elective course in AP Physics senior year, but that's not what, that's a minority of students who, who select to do that. Unlike most of the other disciplines, the physics standards don't spiral. So they don't have the opportunity to demonstrate that proficiency again. So we want to make sure that we capture that while they're in the class. Um, and there will be partial changes in other areas. So I put this next slide in red because one of the, th well, first of all, I should say this, because I really haven't said this. There's nothing in the law that actually requires us to move towards standards-based grading. What there is is a requirement in the law that students can't graduate unless they've developed, demonstrated proficiency against the standards. So our conclusion is that if we don't begin to adopt elements of standards-based grading, we don't want to avoid the surprise that comes at the 11th hour we when students are about to, we want to avoid the surprise that could come if we don't do some standards-based grading pieces. We don't want those surprises to say, you know, in May of 2018 to a group of our next year's ninth graders that they can't graduate and sorry, we didn't let you know that. Um, so we, it's our sense that we have that obligation to communicate that as well as we can. But, um, we will continue to give numerical grades in our classes. Um, our approach to standards-based grading, um, which we are troubleshooting <laughs> uh, actively as we work together, will be to give more information in addition to the numerical grade to say, here's a numerical grade uh, that Quinn Hewitt got. And these are the areas of strength and weakness. These, these, these are the, the, air, the standards against which we think Quinn is on pace to get the standards, and these are the ones that he's not. Um, I hope you don't mind me. No. It becomes more, that's an old teacher thing, so. <laughs> um, so, do standards-based changes mean more assessments? And the answer is no. Um, because really our conclusions about whether students are meeting the standards or not meeting the standards are the results of the assessments that our students take in their classes, okay? Our teachers will have to get more careful in sort of ferreting out the information that the assessments give and be more precise in sort of defining what it is that the assessments are designed to measure and they will have to report more at a more granular level how the students are doing on various standards that may be embedded within a single assessment. But it doesn't mean more assessments. Um, and that, I believe, is the last slide. It is. For those of you who are interested in looking at the standards themselves, if you go to the district website, which is cape.k12. ME.US and down the right hand side if you click on the link that says curriculum and assessment those standards are the first thing you will see on the page the first thing listed will say CEHS adopted graduation standards those are a set of compressed standards that we will be using for reporting where students are, it's kind of the abstract or the Reader's Digest version. Because if we try to report out against the entire Common Core, we're going to have 89 page report cards. So as we look at those, it's a shorter list for the reporting level of here's where students are. Those were 
suggested by the state. We have chosen to adopt those. We may tweak a little bit as we go, but it was a good starting point for teachers to begin this work. Further down, there is a complete list of all the main learning results, links, as well as the guiding principles there right on that page. I think Thank you. Are there please. questions? We'd be glad to. You know, we know that the board has a packed agenda tonight, but we'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Nice try, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> other, other questions? I've got one. OK. okay. Um, how is how the pizza is doing? Um, freaking out. I think I've been hearing oh. this about this for two years. I think uh, you were hired, Ruth Allen, to help support this work, or? So I've been told. <laughs> um, so I think we've been preparing for this, even though the state hasn't given us any, um, you know. Wiggle room. Yeah, we, yeah it, it's, it's that funny, you have to do it, but you don't have to do it yet, but hurry up and do it. Right. Um, work. So how are we doing with preparing and, you know, uh, how the, how's the teacher mm -hmm. support? Certainly, it's an aggressive timetable. And given my druthers, I certainly would have rolled it out somewhat differently. But looking at the timetable that we've been given as our plan A, we need to be prepared to do this in case we aren't given any latitude to do otherwise. Um, I think we've made some good progress. Teachers have been working this year primarily at taking their assessments aligning them to the reporting standards, looking to see where the gaps are, where they need to either rewrite, build an assessment, make sure that they haven't assessed this standard too often at the expense of this one, and really look at the balance across their, their courses. Um, we will have some more intensive work to do with physics this summer to make sure that those pieces are in place as well as foreign language. Jeff and I spent a week at Power School University to yeah, a whole week <laughs> um, to discover a lot of what we can't do with the program, but some things that are possible to make this work more workable for teachers. Um, because the important work that they do is with kids. And we need to make sure that they have that time and that latitude to be involved in instruction, not just record keeping. And so we are looking to see exactly what that's going to look like. There are some pieces that are fitting in nicely. There are some pieces that we're having to chisel some rough edges off. Um, but I think we'll get there. And um, looking to have at least those sets of classes running next year to see what that looks like as we move forward the following year with other classes. And as this goes up into the high school, it will be then coming back down in a couple of years through the middle school that way too. It will be a standards-based system. This does not exist in a silo at the high school, but our timetable is driven right now by the state to do the high school first. Ideally, it would have rolled up. Did that answer your question? Okay. Other questions? Other questions? Okay, I have one more. Yep. Um, guidance is prepared for this so that um, since everyone is going through this in the state of Maine, uh, wait, is it just, it's not just, it's nationally. Leave it, leave it on. I'm, I have another one. Okay. Um, it's nationally, so I'm just. For, well, I'm, it's, it's the state of Maine that this law affects. Yep. Colleges are going to be looking at transcripts from all kinds of places. They already see a lot of schools have gone to proficiency-based reporting. Some have been doing it for years. Okay. And so we've talked to colleges. We've asked them what they're looking for. We are going to be providing the same type of explanation that we provide now for what we're giving them. Just explain, this is what you're looking at. This is what we're telling you. They get that from schools nationwide now. Okay, that's so we are certainly not looking to set kids up with a strange looking transcript and throw them to the wolves. Right. That wouldn't be fair. Um, one clarifying question um, in regards to that very issue, 
we do have our graduating high school seniors not competing necessarily against each other in the district, but against everyone around the nation. So do you know off the top of your head how many other states have common core proficiency-based type standards or have adopted such a curriculum? There, there are not a lot of whole states that have gone in that direction. New Hampshire is certainly ahead of us in, they call it competency, we call it proficiency, it's the same time. It's not mandated in their diplomas quite the same way, but as a state they have moved in that direction. As far as other whole states that have made the leap, probably not. Sections of states, absolutely. <clears throat> I think at peak, I think, I think 47 states have, had adopted the Common Core. Mm -hmm. I think perhaps one or two have dropped out of bits and pieces of it. <clears throat> what is um, a little bit unique about uh, Maine's approach to it is the extent of, sort of local autonomy that the state is giving to the local districts to say that it's up to you as a local district to come up with a system of assessments that is then okay. used to inform a decision. Um, in many states, it's common to have a common assessment or a series of assessments that students take sort of at a state level as an right. external check. Like the New York Regents or the MCAS in Massachusetts. Right. And I would just add, there are public and private schools across the country and around the world, which actually is the com competition for our students. Mm -hmm. It's not just students in the United States today. They really are right. competing for seats in universities against students from around the world, um, but who use proficiency-based mm -hmm. Um, requirements who have standards-based grading and as Ruth Ellen was pointing out so colleges are used to seeing a variety of transcripts they still rely heavily on standardized assessments like the SAT or the ACT AP IB um, types of types of exams but um, certainly not unfamiliar territory thank you are there any other questions or comments I just I want to quickly thank you for for uh, mentioning first the in your slide about why the move towards standards. First, our local reasons, and, and because I know, having participated in the strategic planning process, that the, the reason that um, standards-based uh, and proficiency-based um, approaches are, are in the strategic plan are, are that that was something that was important to uh, the, the teachers and educators who were participating in that process, and that's how that, that came up. Um, and so, you know, the, nicely, the, 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 the law is now, you know, move, moving us along in the direction that we wanted to go, and that, that's not always the case. Um, but we're lucky, um, you know, that in this case, it is the case, that this is something that the district, educators in our district wanted to implement, and uh, as, at least according to my understanding, and that, and that, that, and that the, um, the state has helped move us along in that direction. And then I do have one question, which has to do with the, the the policy on the board policy on graduation requirement. That's something we've looked at not, not so long ago. Um, we're not unused to looking at policies um, repeatedly. Is that something we're going to have to take another look at? <clears throat> that is definitely something we'll have to take another <laughs> okay. look at. Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you. Back on the job. I thought we had one checked off. All right. Well, Jeff and Ruth Allen, thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. your time tonight. Thank you. Um, and so we will move from there to item 5C, 2014-2015 um, middle school mathematics curriculum. And I think um, Michael Tracy and Ruth Ellen Vaughn are, Ruth Ellen's coming back up to join us. Can't leave. Good evening. 
Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some shifts happening at the middle school in terms of mathematics and the rationale, why are we making these shifts? Um, and the reason is we really need to look at beginning with the end in mind. I'm glad Principal Shedd and, and Ruth Allen Vaughn went first because it's a nice progression for showing sort of the end in mind. We need to prepare our students for college and career readiness. We see that throughout, throughout the law, throughout the standards, and, and that's where we're aiming. Uh, so right behind college and career readiness, we have graduation standards that we need to hit. So beginning with that end in mind, um, we're looking at the trajectory we're putting students on to meet these graduation standards, and that requires a shift in the pathways that we're offering in terms of mathematics. We need to provide access to higher level math courses for our students as they reach high school. Um, we, we're looking at the elimination of the need for students to double up in order to reach that end in mind and to reach those graduation standards. It doesn't mean that students would be able to double up should they so choose, but it wouldn't be absolutely required in order to get to some of those higher level maths. It will, yeah, it will remain an option. It will not be a have to any longer. Um, we need to build in some additional time for algebra, algebra excuse me, work as needed so that as students may take an individualized timeline to reach the graduation standards, the pathways we currently had established would not leave enough room for students of a variety of performance levels to perhaps reach the finish line in, in the amount of time that they had. So and it's an accelerated pathway and it needs to happen to create also some more room for students. Um, it also helps uh, with growth towards the, the uh, Cape Elizabeth District Strategic Plan objectives. And um, perhaps most importantly, it's increasing the rigor and expectations for all of our students. Um, as I said, our current pathways would not have all of our students positioned to meet the graduation standards within a reasonable amount of time. With increasing the rigor and expectations for all, um, there is a reciprocal responsibility to make sure we provide the support and the extension for all of our students as needed. So that's the why. So the what is here's what we're currently offering in terms of uh, a, a pathway or classes or uh, content. Um, so in fifth grade, we, we had a control math, a grade five math, and an accelerated math. Sixth grade, uh, a grade six math and an accelerated. Seventh, we were offering four sections, a rational math, a transition math one, a transition seven math, and an algebra one and in eighth grade a trans math one, trans math two, algebra one, and geometry. So creating many different layers and levels um, and, and I think complications to helping our students reach uh, the end in mind. So changes that are being proposed uh, for the 14-15 school year as we will continue to offer an accelerated math class for fifth graders coming in and we'll offer a general math five class um, again, meeting the standards that we need to at that grade level, being clear what do fifth grade students need to know and be able to do by the end of fifth grade. Grade six, we will offer um, again an accelerated math six class. Um, it will not be termed accelerated math and it will really be a pre-algebra course. It is an accelerated pathway. It may not carry an accelerated name, but it is providing an opportunity to to accelerate students on the, on the path towards those graduation standards and we'll offer uh, the Math 6 course. Grade 7, um, we are compacting from the four different classes to a pre-algebra course and an Algebra 1 class that some of our 7th graders will be um, prepared and demonstrating proficiency to, to take Algebra 1 so that by eighth grade we'll be in a position to offer students access to pre-algebra standards, an Algebra one set of standards, and geometry. So the process, how are we going to get there? Um, we need to undergo a, a realignment of our curriculum to meet these standards. 
it's going to require, um, I'd say, significant professional development and helping our teachers get there, familiarity with the standards, work on curriculum, work on differentiation. Ruth Allen's been working very hard on um, securing some math coaching for our teachers to help them through this transition. And for our students, we're going to need to provide some additional supports, both through response to intervention. Also, uh, we have an enrichment block that's being built into our master schedule for next year. And also increasing opportunities for push-in support while all students receive instruction from a regular classroom math teacher, they'll also have additional opportunities for tier two support in the classroom with additional resources and, and teachers provided. I'm sorry, so just a clarification, push-in support is the in-classroom teacher tier? Correct. There would be another. There would be the regular classroom teacher, and then there might be an. There is an additional teacher who could come in and help with small groups, um, whether oh, they need. Not for TA for the teacher, but for the students. For the stu for the students, correct. Yes. The, the math coaching is for the teachers. The push and support is for the the students. So. And what's the enrichment block again? Sorry. Uh, sure. The enrichment block is a. It's a. It's a set period of time built into the schedule at every grade level every day where teachers can reinforce concepts that have been taught. They can work with groups to provide remediation and extension um, and they can also provide enrichment for students who are already demonstrating proficiency on that lesson, that unit, or that, that particular set of standards. Thank you. Could you go back to the previous slide? I just want to clarify for the audience that by 2014-15, it says it, 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 it would indicate that this, the point is you have Algebra 1 pre-algebra in grade 8, you have Geometry Algebra 1 in pre-algebra. The reality is it's not just one class, it's a course in Algebra 1. So as many people that can qualify for Algebra 1 can take it now in 7th grade. And as many people that can qualify for it will take it in 8th or Geometry in 8th. So the net result is the vast majority of people that come out of middle school will have at least algebra, and then those that are capable of it will have the opportunity to take geometry. Is that that's, correct? that's correct. And we're providing access and opportunities that weren't necessarily there for as many students. Oh, or also. I, I will talk about that, yes. Okay. Can I just add one clarification? Um, that pre-algebra is a retitling of the transition math courses. Correct, it, thank it's you. It's essentially the same curricula that has been offered either as transitions, which is a year-long course, transitions one, or transitions two, which is a year-long course split over two years. But essentially, pre-algebra replaces the transitions class. It's just a retitling. Thank okay. you. John, can I ask a question? Yes. The reason why this has happened this isn't have anything to do with the Common Core and how we're breaking down the, um, you know, getting, I know we're getting to proficiency based, but each child, once they hit uh, this skill, then they can move on to the next skill. We've always talked about we give children what they need when they need it, and so we're not, is this that philosophy? It still is. We're looking at, number one, the standards that the students are being held to have increased significantly in rigor. And we need to make sure that students have the opportunity to be able to meet those graduation standards once they hit high school by having a strong foundation here. And as we break up transitions one, transitions two, and really slow that process down, it makes it very difficult for those students to get all the way through up through functions in high school. And so we're trying to provide a stronger foundation at the middle school level to give them a springboard up into high school so that they can complete on time or go further. And you get this is also supported by the IXL math program and that starts in Pond Cove, I believe. Correct. And so where this has been working in, again, this is not a brand new, Michael, you came in, what, a year? Uh, six months now? Eight months. So this is something that we've been, because we had IXL before you, so we're work, we've been working this in. I, I guess, Meredith, 
Yeah. I excel is a is a support for students as they're working through mm -hmm. skills. It certainly will function as additional support as students work through these classes as well. And you have other things as well, but yeah. absolutely, thank you. And, and as you mentioned, the Common Core, the Common Core contains all the prerequisites, K to seven, yeah. to prepare students to be proficient to to access algebra standards in grade eight. So. It, it works, it's aligned, and I, we, we can get our students there by, by grade eight. Um, I did skip over a point. The algebra uh, that we'd be offering um, by 15, 16, all of our eighth grade students would have access to algebra one and geometry. We'd be positioned to a point to get all eighth grade students there. And it will provide a foundation for that physics course that Ruth Ellen and, and Jeff mentioned that if all freshmen are, are expected to take physics, um, there's a lot of evidence that they need a strong background in algebra in order to be successful. And I skipped over that point. I apologize. Any other questions? I just have one more. Okay. I'm assuming that this started, that you're also working down to um, Pond Cove and that this is work that's not just middle school that but it's aligned K. It, again, it's with the changes that we need to make in order to get all kids where they need to be. Shifts have to happen somewhere. Yep. And so this was the linchpin to start the shifts. Okay. As these courses roll in and we have kids as eighth graders who've had algebra one, then that will certainly begin to shift high school programming and we are looking at stepping things up through Pond Cove to get students ready for this. So yes. Thank you. Thank you both for your time. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. Okay, so uh, the superintendent is passing out, I believe, the school climate survey results uh, and will be summary um, results and we'll be discussing them. Did you, did you have a comment first, David? Well, John, yes. Actually, I have a, I wrote a speech because I think we're, that I think the public has to understand something about these changes in math. And I'd like maybe five, ten minutes to speak on it before we move to the next topic. Please, go ahead. Um, I asked for this opportunity uh, to speak about these advances in middle school because it's something I've been advocating for since before I was on the school board. Um, it is a far more rigorous and advanced math in middle school that's now being required. Everybody will take Algebra one, and everybody will have the opportunity to take geometry. That is a significant leap forward for Kate. And I believe that that's absolutely an essential move that I've been advocating for, for, I, I use advocate, I've probably been a pain in the butt for, for about five years, but it's something I feel very, very strongly about. And I want to put a little flesh on the bones of what uh, uh, Principal Tracy and, and Ruth Allen said, because I actually lived this with my son. Um, I studied this issue, uh, I looked at the math, high school requirements, both science and math, I looked at college requirements, I studied the SAT, I spoke to SAT experts, uh, I did, I spoke to teachers, I read uh, about what people are taking internationally for math as compared to what we're taking in the United States, and that's who our kids compete against for college and thereafter. And um, I did all that because I, quite frankly, um, I made a terrible mistake in middle school. Uh, even though my son qualified for taking advanced math with 99th percentile in all levels of math, I did not insist that he get into the advanced math program. I should have. Um, but quite frankly, at that time, it was limited. It was limited in seats. I don't know how, how any other way to, to put it. 
And that's not something Cape should put up with. And it's taken quite a while to make that change. But it came home for me because my son decided by the time he left middle school and entered high school, he wanted to, he loved math and science. And that's when I discovered he was at a severe disadvantage by not having this level of rigorous math in middle school. Um, he set a goal of taking AP Physics and Calculus by the time he graduated. And let me tell you, that was an enormous task. He had to take six math courses to make up for what he didn't, we're now offering two of which in middle school. He had to take that in two different summers. Uh, he had to take on extra tutoring uh, during his freshman year to be able to take on this uh, physics first uh, class. Um, and he did it, and he did very well, but quite frankly, it was not, I, I firmly believe it's not necessary for a town like Cape Elizabeth to force somebody to go through that. That was extra stress, that was extra work, that was extra anxiety, all putting on a kid who was a freshman, which is a fairly delicate being, going into high school. Um, I say that because uh, he's now in college, he's majoring in science and math, so I don't have a dog in this fight. My son's gone, and he's the only child I have. But I do have, um, still care about this issue, and I don't think a single Cape kid should have to go through what my son went through. And now he won't have to, or she won't have to. And I'm convinced that taking algebra and, if possible, geometry in middle school is absolutely critical to the future education and life experiences of our children. And I say that for at least three reasons based on my research and my knowledge of high school and colleges. Uh, first, it will substantially enhance the educational experience at high school. It will substantially increase our students' ability to get into the college of their own choice. And I will talk at the end about a, an excellent book, if anybody wants to read it, called The Smartest Kids in the World. It will show you why a rigorous math program at an early stage, middle school, will make our children far more competitive in life, especially in post-college work. Uh, first, uh, high school experience is, is fairly simple. You heard physics. That's called physics first. We are one of the few schools that teach physics to freshmen. Most other schools don't. There are a lot of good academic reasons to do that. The problem with that, and it's an excellent idea, I fully support it, is that you need algebra. There is no way you can do physics without algebra. Uh, it requires it. And to take algebra for the first time at the same time as you're taking physics, is an extremely difficult task. Is it possible? Yes. My son did it. But to do it, he had to be tutored by his math teacher, Elaine Brunel. He had to be t tutored by Dr. Efron. He had to get substantial help. I mean, he wasn't the only one. There were about five or six of these kids. Substantial help from our Achievement Center. I don't, he couldn't have done it without the Achievement Center. We're one of the few schools that has that. Um, but basically, he had to take the tough part of it was you have to learn physics, and to learn physics you sort of need advanced Algebra 1. Algebra 1 class isn't teaching you those concepts fast enough. So each week they would learn more advanced algebra concepts when they didn't even yet have the basic algebra concepts down. So that creates an enormous strain on kids. Their first year in high school taking one of the toughest courses in our school. And that simply was not necessary. It creates anxiety, pressure, all sorts of things you want kids to avoid. And there's simply, again, no need for this in a town like Cape Elizabeth. And that is now eliminated. And that puts a little flesh on this physics first problem that we're now solving. Secondly, it affects the amount and depth of math one can complete under the new system in um, high school. Our old system was you took algebra, then geometry as a sophomore, algebra two as a junior, and FST, which is function, statistics, and trigonometry. That's what the functions were that Ruth Ellen used. Those are very important things. They're all required on the SAT. Uh, but what that does mean is if you follow that path without doubling up, and let me tell you, that's taking, doubling up means taking two math courses in the same year, not an easy thing to do, and you give an up course, or doing what my son did, spending two summers being tutored in honors geometry and honors pre-calculus which we were told he could, it couldn't be done. Honors pre calculus couldn't be done this summer. And he and another young lad did it. Uh, but what that meant was you could not take pre-calculus and calculus by the time you graduated. And those were enormously important math skills to have. Not just for the kids who want to do STEM in college, science, 
technology, engineering, and math, I believe. You need those for that. But as I'll talk later, it's very important that you take these type of courses and have all, as much math as you can for learning, uh, for, for having learned that you need to compete in life. Um, the third um, advantage that we now have is that it increases the level of sciences one can take in high school than if you didn't have these math. For example, the best example I can think of is AP Physics C. If you didn't have this new program, you wouldn't be, able to take, wouldn't be able to take that AP course. And it's one of the best courses we have. Why? You cannot take that course without at least having calculus at the same time. Still difficult to do without calculus at the same time as a senior. But my son was able to take that course because he, he, he put in those two extra courses that we're now covering in uh, middle school. And if you had kids that have tried it with even pre-calculus, can't do it very well. Um, so it does affect the amount of sciences you can take in high school. And finally, it may seem small, but it's not small to the kids in there in, in high school. It levels the playing fields in terms of your class rank and your uh, weighted point, uh, grade point average. Our courses in high school are college, the major ones, or the three I will talk about are college prep, honors, and AP. College prep gets a weighted average of 1.0. Honors gets 1.3, which means if you got a 90 in a CP course, but you took the same course at an honors level, your, your 90 now becomes 30% 30, 30 higher. And if you take an AP, it's 35% higher. And it's your cumulative uh, weighted GPA, which goes for, what, for class rank. That's what determines what's in the top 10% of our class, which I will tell you is a major factor, whether it should or shouldn't be, it's a major factor colleges ask it on every single application that I saw that my son had to fill out. So that significantly improves the quality of a high school experience. It simply improves uh, ability, a kids' ability to take what they want in a high school and to take what they need. It also improves uh, Cape students to compete in a college pool. Very simple thing. The SAT, the math section of the SAT, English and math, the math test requires, and it's usually taken sophomore by some, junior by most, is 35 to 40 percent algebra two, algebra one and algebra two. And it's 10 to 15 percent statistics and probability. That's FSD, which on an old course you take your senior year. So when you take your SAT, your junior year, you do not have a course under the old system, a course that's going to cover 10 to 15 percent of that exam. You will not have taken that by the time you take the SAT. The single most important criteria, one of the single most important criteria that we use to get into college. Also, you will be still taking algebra two. So if you take your SAT in the spring, some of the more comp complex concepts of algebra two won't have been taught yet. That's putting our kids at a disadvantage that's completely unnecessary. Now, granted, our teachers did a wonderful job trying to uh, teach that by up accelerating it, by doing, doing certain other things, but there's simply no need for that. And now they don't have that disadvantage. They will have full algebra two, and they'll be completing their uh, FST by their senior year. And that's assuming they don't double up trying to get into pre-calculus or uh, by their junior year, sorry. And they'll have pre-calculus by the senior year. I misspoke. Um, in fact, I would, I'll mention briefly the new SAT. That it's, it looks like there may be in some pre-calculus in the new SAT for math and possibly even calculus. It's unknown yet, which would see more why we need to have more rigor in our uh, middle school. Um, colleges, and this is, there's three more points about college. Colleges literally count the amount of honors and AP courses you take. That's one of the ways they divide up this massive pool of application. The more honors and AP class you have, the, more, the better your chances. By the, under the old system, algebra was a CP course. That meant by definition you had one less honors course, no matter what you did, unless you doubled up or took an extra course in the summer. You had to take literally an extra course, doubling up wouldn't do any good, and probably one less AP course. Significant? Maybe not, but why have it? Um, and then for STEM colleges, the science, technology, engineering, and math colleges like the Polytechs, the MITs of the world, you need calculus on your resume. You absolutely need it. They won't even look at you. Um, and I discovered uh, that for a traditional liberal arts school where my son basically applied to, you need to have at least pre-calculus, 
And if you had calculus, that was considered a major bump up. And our kids need every bump up we can get when we're competing in the pool as they have to compete in for college. And now they have the opportunity to do that. And that's for a traditional liberal arts college. Um, lastly, the third one is about success in life. And, I'm, and I can't claim any credit for this. It all comes from an excellent book I encourage every parent to read, The Smartest Kids in the World. It talks about how Finland, Poland, and South Korea are beating everybody's brains in and all these international tests and why. But it said some things that I think directly apply to this. U.S. students are 26th in the world among developed nations, 26th. That's in math and equally below average in science. And that really can't continue. And I think one of the ways to do this is increase the rigor of our math in middle school. More importantly, and I will quote this from the book, math is a made, the amount and complexity of math that you have through high school and college is a major predictor of a kid's future potential. Quote, teenagers who have mastered high school math classes uh, high-level math classes were more likely to graduate from college, even adjusting for such factors as race and income. They also earned more money after college. Did, Why does if you could conclude? Because we we just we still have the budget ahead of us. Today. That's okay. You, you, you don't you, you ask me to give us. I know, but you used give it. ten minutes. Here's here's the most important one. Why does math matter so much? And again, I'll quote, math is the language of logic. It's a disciplined, organized way of thinking. It requires, a, it requires rigorous thinking. It basically teaches you the language of logic, the ability to reason, the ability to detect patterns, the ability to think uh, deductively, in essence, critical thinking, which is a course I've taught. It also teaches you work habits, the intellectual rigor and work habits that are essential to, I'm skipping John, to success in college and in life. The bottom line is, and I'll, I will end with what I usually end with, was the Churchill quote, and I'm skipping here. This all boils down to what we're, what we're training our kids to do. And I'll quote Churchill, continuous effort, not strength or brilliance, is the key to unlocking our potential. Because we now have this in middle school and high school, this kind of rigorous, uh, intellectually demanding programs, we are unlocking the potential of our kids in Cape. Thanks. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. And I do want to thank our principal, middle school principal, Ruth Ellen, of course, Meredith, and by the way, all the math teachers in middle school who are taking on this challenge. It's a significant challenge, and they really should be encouraged in it, and I applaud them for taking it on. OK, thank you. Next up, we have the, the district uh, climate survey. So I'm going to try to briefly give an overview of what for us is about 1,200 pages of data um, from these three surveys. And I'm going to focus really on the district level results, sort of the summary results. Um, building principals will be sharing more specific detail about building level results at the climate workshop um, scheduled for the end of April, April 29th, I believe. <laughs> so why did we do these surveys in the first place? Um, in part because our mission and vision have um, specific goals around climate and culture and student and teacher engagement. And for us, we needed to establish some baseline data in order to determine whether or not we're making growth. Um, I will say overall that there weren't a lot of surprises in the data because of the work that we had done through the mission and vision um, and values process as well as the strategic planning process. But it did reinforce some of, some of the pieces we were already aware of. The surveys were administered um, in, between mid and late November within the testing window offered by the National Center for School Leadership, and they're the group that um, tabulated the survey for us, um, distributed the survey. Results were returned to the district in late January, and the district leadership team reviewed those results in February. Building administrators then rolled out the results to their faculty and began the discussions about the results in February and in March. Some guidance to interpreting scores, and again, this is provided directly by the National Center for School Leadership. Um, strengths, scores of 75% or above, favorable, and favorable are the strongly agree or strongly agree categories, are considered real strengths. And anywhere where you're 10% or more above the national average is considered a very positive strength. Opportunities, or 
weaknesses, depending on which vernacular you might choose. If you have 20% or more people responding unfavorably, meaning they strongly disagree or disagree, um, those are considered areas for improvement. And anywhere where you're 10% um, or below the national average is what they call a significant risk to be explored. So there may be some local variables that play into um, why that area may be below the national average. I'm going to start with the student engagement and satisfaction results, and that looks at a variety of areas, including, and I'm not going to read them all to you, but school climate, um, relationships with adults, voice choice, engagement, um, flexibility of instruction. The significant organizational strengths identified in the survey, survey which are um, what they call sort of locally top-ranked responses that weren't top-ranked nationally, so where we had really high favorable scores were. I'm satisfied with the over quali overall quality of my school. And you can see our local results and the national results there. I'm treated fairly by the adults at my school, and teachers listen and respond when I have something to say. The very positive strengths are those areas where we scored 10% or more above the national averages. I feel safe at school, significant one, uh, I think, today. My parents are well informed about my academic progress, and there's a theme that runs through um, in this community that we'll summarize at the end. My teachers encourage me to do well in school. I understand the academic expectations that the school has for me. My teachers help me with schoolwork when I need it. Weaknesses or opportunities, um, again, these are locally the lowest, now conversely, the lowest ranked responses that weren't lowest ranked nationally. Um, one area, um, which again, we surveyed students in grades 5 through 12, only students in grades 5 through 8 really take um, standardized tests, but um, I know how I performed on the most recent state standardized tests. I'm provided with useful information about careers, colleges, and other opportunities. There we scored on par with the national average. Uh, my school provides students with many options in terms of classes to take. Areas for improvement, or where 20% or more of students responded unfavorably. My school provides students with many options in terms of classes to take. That was particularly true at the middle school which makes sense when we think about how our middle school is structured as opposed to the high school where students have more input into um, choices in, for courses. I'm very interested in my schoolwork. My schoolwork often consists of using hands-on examples as part of the learning process. My teachers align their lessons to match my personal learning style. My teachers seem to understand how I learn best. Again, one in four, still below the national average, but one in four of our students responding unfavorably to that question. And the teachers in my school do a good job of making the material interesting to me. Some of the local concerns that we identified, and some of these you've seen in some of the targets that we incorporated into um, our uh, goals for the mission and vision and the strategic plan. Only 58% of our students report that bullying is not a problem at their school. And while that is significantly above the national average, it's not where we would like to see it. Only 76% of our students report that they have at least one teacher or counselor who knows them well as a person. Again, while that means only one in four students don't feel that way, we think we can do better. Only 54% of students report that they're provided with useful information regarding careers, colleges, and other opportunities. Again, this aligns with some of the, one of the goal areas in our strategic plan. And only 50% of students report that their schoolwork requires them to think about how various topics relate to real life situations. Again, as we know, students going into the work world today, those, the jobs that they go into are jobs that don't exist necessarily right now. They'll be newly developed. And so to be thinking about how the skills that you're learning in school can be applied in a variety of contexts is really important. The Parent Engagement and Satisfaction Survey looked at, um, again, a variety of areas, academics, communication, homework, engagement, school climate, school pride among them. The significant organizational strengths. 
I attend most school events offered to parents, such as parent-teacher conferences and open houses. There's an active parent association at my child's school, and my child's school is well regarded in the community. A very positive strength for us, um, where we scored 10% or more above the national average, I regularly check my child's information, such as grades or attendance, using an online resource. I'm laughing because my kids must have taken this. <laughs> this, this was the parent, <coughs> but they know you're watching, or you're, okay. Um, organizational weaknesses, again, these are our lowest ranked responses locally, but they weren't the lowest ranked nationally. The level of difficulty associated with my child's homework is appropriate. I'm satisfied with the services provided by my child's guidance counselor, and the school makes effective use of technology for instructional purposes. An area for improvement identified, this is the only one, which is why there's only one on here, um, where 20% or more um, parents responded unfavorably. The school does a great job of challenging my child to his or her fullest potential. Um, again, that wasn't a surprise to us in working through um, the process over the last um, couple of years. Some of our local concerns through discussion, that only 55% of parents report that their child's school does a very good job of meeting the needs of all of its students. Again, this aligns with our mission and vision. Similar to the student response, only 48% of parents report that their child's school does an excellent job dealing with student bullying. Only 72% of our parents report that their child's school prepares him or her to be a good citizen. Only 48% of parents report that their child's school offers him or her opportunities to explore areas of interest outside the core content areas. Again, passion, ethics you see running through here. Um, only 56% of parents report that the school does a great job of challenging my child to his or her full potential. So that one's in there twice, because we think it's important. And then the school or staff climate and culture survey, which looked at areas of, again, school pride, communication, um, parent connections, work environment, accountability, readiness for change, and more. Our significant organizational strengths, again, you see some themes. My school or district is well regarded in the community. 98% of our staff say yes. Parents at my school are very engaged in the learning of their child. The parents at my school are very involved in their child's school life. Parents at my school are very aware of how their student is performing on homework and tests. And I consider my school or district to be an excellent school or district. are very positive strengths in the staff survey. I plan to be with my school or department two years from now. I'd recommend my school or district to a family member seeking a school for their children. Many parents volunteer time to assist in my school. Teachers at my school are well supported by parents with respect to discipline issues. Teachers at my school have positive relationships with most parents. And the students in my school or district show respect for our teachers. Our challenges, I'm clear about how my performance will be evaluated. Only 35% of our teachers responded positively to that. And as uh, Kate's nodding, she's involved with the work of the evaluation committee. That's a process that is um, being redefined and there's some legislation guiding that process as well. I know the specifics of how my school or district intends to improve student achievement in the coming year, maybe 32%. I'm given adequate feedback on the work I do, again, relating to evaluation. And my school or department has a highly effective school or department planning process. Areas for improvement, where we had 20% or more respondents responding unfavorably. I have time available during the school or work day to collaborate with my peers regarding curriculum and instruction and best practice. Again, time. And uh, this year in particular, I think teachers at all of our buildings are feeling particularly stretched by time demands with some of the curricular changes and proficiency-based pieces, common core. School-wide department meetings are a good use of my time. I'm involved in decisions that affect my work. I feel the amount of work 
amount of work required of me is reasonable. I know precisely how my or our students performed last year on standardized tests compared to other students in the school, district, and state. My school or department does a good job of holding people accountable for results. And teachers actively use student achievement data in collaboration with peers on a regular basis. A few more. I'm satisfied with the professional development opportunities that are available to me. My school or department has a highly effective school or department improvement planning process. Our school or district improvement planning process is inclusive and considers feedback from a wide group of teachers and employees within our school or district. And staff development opportunities at my school or district are relevant to my work. And again, some of these have been incorporated into the strategic plan goals. Some of the local concerns, again, only 39% of our staff, you saw the um, unfavorable response to this, but the favorable response, only 39% of our staff report that they're clear about how their performance will be evaluated. Only 71% of our staff report that they're encouraged to try new ways of doing things. And only 30% of our staff report that staff development opportunities at their school or district are very relevant to their work. So summarizing, <laughs> Again, there's a lot of information. Um, the district results are overall very favorable and consistent with national data. And you, you'll see that, um, again, as we move into looking at the building level results at the end of April. Parent involvement and communication is viewed as a real strength by both parents and staff. Student-teacher relationships are viewed by both students and teachers as positive and respectful. Um, to summarize the student piece, I would say that students are looking for choice, relevance, and personalization. Parents are looking for increased choice and challenge. Staff are looking for feedback, increased involvement in decision-making, decision and personalization or choice around professional development. Next steps, as I've mentioned, the school level summaries, focus areas will be shared at the April 29th Climate and Culture Workshop, which will include some other pieces of climate and culture work that are going on in the schools. Targets for improvement over some of this baseline data are built into the strategic plan goals. And the bigger piece is that there needs to be continued dialogue about how we can work together to open minds and open doors. Thank you, Meredith. Other questions? No questions. Okay, I, I have one, just one. Can you talk a little bit more, can you t talk a little bit more about the last point about the baseline, how this survey will be um, used to define baseline data that, we'll, that we will use going forward to evaluate how we're doing on our strategic plan. I think that's just something I want to make sure. Sure. And the intent is to reoffer this survey on an annual basis. Um, and we've already built into the draft goals that were shared with the board some of the data that came out of this particular survey. So there are goals for um, Increasing the percentage of students who say bullying is not a problem at their school, as one example. Um, increasing the percentage of parents who respond that their children are challenged. Increasing the percentage of um, teachers who say that staff development is meeting their needs. Um, those are some specific examples that are already incorporated into those goals. Okay, and, what, and uh, I know we'll be doing some more work on the strategic plan. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and and, I, and I, with these results, I can take a closer look at that. Um, but are there areas where we didn't include um, goals that appear from the survey results uh, perhaps should be goals incorporated into the strategic plan? Or do you think that the strategic plan addresses the, those broad principles of, of uh, I believe that it group. does. I think that's an area for discussion with the board at the workshop. Um, I believe that it does, and I believe our administrative team felt that it did. Um, but I'll, I'll talk more about the continued dialogue about the strategic plan scheduled for the early release day in April um, in a bit. But, but I, I think we've encompassed the areas, and I think we've chosen some targets that we think reflect the values that we heard throughout the mission and vision process and the strategic planning process. And 
part of the draft process is to receive feedback on those and determine whether or other people feel that they do. Okay. And I, I would encourage um, members of the public to uh, um, access the, the, this uh, survey's results, um, to access the strategic plan and to make their own assessment as to whether that, that, you know, they, they believe that the strategic plan is addressing, um, you know, the areas, the opportunities for improvement that, that, the, that the survey, the climate survey identifies in the district. That said, we will move on to item 5B. E. Um, I know I'm sorry, um, we have a lot to go through, but I also know we have to get to the budget workshop. And yep. it may be, uh, my experience is when people are fresher to make some decisions. So um, maybe is there a way, not that I don't think these other items are important, but that we could uh, Pick a hard time to go into the budget workshop because we have to have that completed uh, tonight. Um, I don't know how much time we need for the remaining three items on here, but we could uh, potentially postpone. Um, certainly, F, we could postpone these for after the budget workshop. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't sound? mean to jump ahead, but I just am mindful no, I that it, got along. you know, all of a sudden it could be 11 at night and um, people's um, well, don't mindfulness we, is why a don't we, diminished. Um, why don't we move to item six and we'll come, we'll circle back to um, 5E if we've got the strength uh, later in the evening. Um, may I have a motion? I move we enter workshop session to discuss the 2014 2015 budget. Second. All those in favor? Seven. Okay, so um, we're going to enter a workshop format, Michael, so I will turn the uh, gavel over to you. Virtual gavel. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, we'll start these off like we usually do. Um, you know, beginning the budget process, we said there were some uh, uncertainties remaining. Um, fortunately, we have uh, more certainty on items such as uh, health insurance, um, a little bit more certainty on um, some visibility and to state revenue, although not, not great. Um, but also we have some new information regarding some enrollment or some um, charter school placement. So um, there were some several items we had left open from the last budget workshop, contingency funding, uh, additional teacher, uh, some undesignated fund balance revenue, which uh, is a revenue recognition issue, um, and there might be some other housekeeping items. Um, so that will be kind of the format and uh, to help the board understand the budget impact of some new information, I'll um, let the superintendent go through uh, spe specifically the um, charter school placement and funding model as well as uh, the net effect of that with some health insurance rate information. Thank Mike, you, Michael. Michael, wouldn't it be helpful to make it clear that the, it, the decision to fund kindergarten is, in essence, you know, we've discussed it in the universe? Absolutely. And the, the list I gave was not an exhaustive list. Uh, those were just some items, but obviously, uh, circling back on the kindergarten, uh, full day kindergarten implementation cost, um, as well as board uh, follow up questions on that. So, uh, obviously, anyone who has other items or uh, questions, we, we can cover all those, but those were just some of the leftover items, David. I actually didn't think pre kindergarten was left over, but that's all right. I mean, excuse me, kindergarten was left over. Okay, so what, whatever, okay. Fair enough. So you see the date at the top is 4-8. This, this is the revision to the sheet that you received on 3-18. So the only changes that are incorporating, incorporated into this document are the changes to health insurance. Um, we received our rate information, and instead of the 8% that we had proposed, we received an increase of 2.5%. 
Um, that's a savings of roughly 130,000 to the district. However, we also received um, letters from charter schools in the area, including Baxter Academy and Fiddleheads, that we have six students enrolled um, for the fall semester in those charter programs. And to the district, each of those enrollees represents a cost of about $10,000. So we had to add in the cost of $60,000 for those tuition payments. So the net difference, which is incorporated into the number you see here for expenditures, is $74,150. So from your 318 sheet, you see a decrease um, of the $74,150. So this sheet maintains the assumptions that were in place at our 318 meeting. It doesn't reflect the discussion from the 325 workshop because, as Michael pointed out, no decisions were made by the board at that time. So this represents the updates based on known information, and then I think we're going to pick up from there with the discussion that we left off with on the 25th. So to help the board understand that, you know, uh, this reflects the change in state revenue, which Correct. we can't, you know, th that is the estimate. Uh, it reflects the health insurance premium, the actual health insurance premium rates, and it also reflects uh, six students that are, move are uh, going to charter school. In other words, these are what I would call, um, you know, mandated or required cost. In other words, we can't say, well, that's actually paid less for health insurance or um, so this gets you updated to what are required non-discretionary um, updates from the last um, update we had. Right and the number at the bottom is also updated in terms of the tax impact. Does anyone have any question on the uh, charter tuition No, I mean, I would just point out that the district is required to pay tuition for, for charter school uh, students. I, I, you know, I, I have no problem with, with um, you know, parents cho making choices about, the you know, the best place to educate their children. Um, but I, I'm not a big fan of the, the, the state's approach to funding um, charter schools, which is in effect to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to redirect um, uh, Ten thousand, approximately ten thousand uh, dollars per student, uh, toward the, the charter school from Cape Elizabeth, um, out of outside of our budget. Um, there is, you know, when you've got six students across many, multiple grades, um, there's essentially zero opportunity for Cape Elizabeth to save any um, any funds. Um, uh, so um, the the you know, the cost of, the, we, we'll, we'll spend what we were going to spend to educate these students, and we'll also spend, um, you know, $10,000 per student to, um, to educate them at a charter school. So again, I, I have no quibble with, with parents making choices about, about um, where their child is best educated. I think that's every parent's prerogative, and, and I applaud those choices, um, but, I, but I, um, I think that the, the state, has failed to understand that they're they're actually increasing um, by as much as 50 percent the, the cost of educating these these children in 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 Maine um, by essentially um, forcing us to pay for their education twice. If I may, just as a contrast, Meredith, I I'm not I'm not sure I remember per pupil what do we receive through EPS. Is it a roughly 1100 No, it's, it's a little over 3000 It's okay. about $3,200. 3, okay. So it's a pretty big difference. So there's significant local funds mm -hmm. going, going to, to Baxter Academy. And Fiddlehead. And Meredith, uh, given, uh, you know, enrollment projections are challenging, you know, what, what's the notification deadline uh, for, is there one? No. In, okay. Um, students can enroll, and as long as there are slots available in those charters, they can enroll up in, into the school year. Um, so October 1st would essentially be the deadline for us in terms of whether or not we have to pay out. It's based on the October 1st enrollment that we submit to the state. 
So in essence, we, it's possible we could see more, like we were concerned mm -hmm. about last budget meeting. Mayor, am I right that we get, if, if students come back to Cape, that money comes back with them, but not until the next October, or is it? That's correct. It would not be until the following year. Right. Right. If they came back, if they went in October, came back to us in November, we wouldn't see those funds. Technically, they might be incorporated into the April 1st enrollment count um, for the part of the year. But thank you. Go ahead, David. Um, on the form we're now looking at, when it says the percentage for local property tax, um, and it says 3.9, I, I can't see you, Meredith, but I'm assuming that that is not net to taxes, which is a very amorphous number, but it's really the amount of percentage increase in uh, a person would expect in their local property taxes for their house as a result of our educational budget. The 36 cents per thousand at the bottom reflects what an individual taxpayer would see based on the school portion of the budget. Okay, what percentage, do you have a percentage increase? Three, that's 3.1. David, you fl so given many requests, we've done, this has all the flavors of net tax, tax rates. And we have so many flavors. The 36, per, the 36 cents of tax rate uh, on the school department portion, it would be a 3.1% increase in the tax rate, or we're using the same definition um, for net the taxes. There's expenditures as well, so. Well, I, I think it's important because I think the average, I've said this every year, the average taxpayer only cares about how much their taxes are gonna go up as a result of the schools, and that's 3.1. Just so people understand that. Correct. Um, so does, every, does everyone understand what's on this sheet and what's not on it? In other words, this is an update of uh, state revenue, the most recent information. This is an update of our actual health insurance premiums. And this is an update includes the most recent data on charter tuition payments to charter schools. And that way this, we'll, then we'll go into the other open items, but you have this as a base. Um, Yes, I just have a clarifying question. David, did I hear you say that, according to this budget, do you read it that the um, local property tax increase was 3.1? That's right. Yeah. Okay. If you flip your sheet over. But that's why I was to clar clar clarify, Joe, that the first page is that it's sort of Thank a net you. to tax number, which is not what people really think about. They think about what's increased their tax rate. I was reading the wrong side of the It's paper. actually lower. To say well, they hit the good number on all these other numbers. Gooder number, better number. The reason we did it like this is given there's many moving pieces, um, as there are every year when we go through the budget process, and the only budget that we update on the website is the one that's actually approved by the school board. This was a way we could help school board members understand the, the base. Um, so whatever we talk to, Next, regarding contingency, undesignated fund revenue recognition and uh, teacher staffing changes would be incremental, would be in excess, would be on top of this right here. Does everyone, is everyone with me? So, so. <laughs> moving right on. Um, at the last meeting, there were three um, items raised by the board for discussion. One was adding a teacher at Pond Cove at a cost of $71,000. One was adding $40,000 to contingency at a cost of $40,000. And the other was reducing the carry forward from $500,000 to $400,000. So this sheet reflects all three of those changes. You'll note that um, instead of $0.36 cents per thousand, um, the increase goes to 49 cents per thousand, which is, I'm looking at the place, thank you, a 4.2% um, increase to tax. So, uh, given that it's important for each school board member to uh, have an opportunity to um, discuss these additional items, what we had requested the superintendent was to provide a uh, financial impact budget analysis um, if we had included those items, but I also realize that um, people may have clarifying questions on 
any or all, all of these items. So um, whichever order you want to discuss them is uh, fine, fine by me. Um, if anyone wants to start, or I would be happy to if there are. So to help nod it along, why don't we start with the, uh, the, the first one, additional teacher for Pond Cove. David. Um, I won't bother to say my recollection is different, but it is different. Um, I think we discussed the need to add an additional teacher, and I thought we discussed that it could be either fourth or sixth, and it would be up to the school administration to determine based on the circumstances come fall. Um, I, 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 I would, I still have an issue with adding a teacher specifically uh, for the same reason I stated last time, and that is based on our projections, which are accurate to within uh, overall between 1.2 1, 1 to 1.3 percent, uh, and given the fact that the sweet spot for class size is not class size small, always better, class size big, always bad, the sweet spot is 18 to 25 based on all best available data. I think that having 23 for fourth with and I have thought about it since then because I thought people made a lot of really good arguments that um, having some money for the contingency for fourth or sixth grade or whatever, I, I now support, which I don't think I specifically supported before. Um, how much that is between 100 to 140, I'll listen to what everybody says. But I, I, I personally would advocate for uh, that sum be put in contingency and letting the administration the school administration and the district team leadership, which is Pond Cove, middle school, and the superintendent, uh, and if necessary, run by us, see what actually happens and see where we really need that money. Um, and if we will, things are completely fluid. Um, um, but that's basically my position. Oh, I should say that I do believe dropping the, uh, con the undesignated reserves to 400 and dropping revenue, I mean, increasing the undesignated reserves to 500 versus 400 is completely prudent because that's a 2% required by our, our, um, our uh, by prudent business practices. We should have at least 2%. So I guess I covered everything. I, I just want to say that um I believe that it is our administration and our school, um, superintendent who will read the numbers and more importantly than reading the numbers, we'll read the dynamics of the, the grouping of the class in our schools. And I trust that you will make the right decision. You will hire the teacher when you need to hire the teacher. And that if it's, um, it looks, in our conversation, it looked like we have, um, I just want to make sure we go by the data. I don't want to go by, you know, there's so many houses and I know people are moving in, I know people are not moving in. I want to go by the data that we get from our um, town council, the town uh, planning, uh, I know I'm not saying it well, but the town planning people, that when we have our data, when people enroll, that we have it. And then I trust that you're not gonna, that the, the administration is going to hire a teacher when the time is right to hire the teacher because we don't, um, I trust that we do not let children suffer um, because of one, because one child's over. I trust that we have the support in the schools we have, this is the first year in the five years I've been here, we've got guidance counselors, we have social workers, we have um, a vice principal, we have principal, we have uh, uh, health, uh, you know, computer in the classrooms. We have everything we need needed that we haven't had for years before. And we're talking about if we need another teacher, we'll hire another teacher. But if we find that, boy, people went to Fiddleheads instead of to Cape, that we're not firing a teacher. Um, as we know that this, this happens a lot. People move in, people move out, and we don't have that. And I just want to make sure 
It's that you'll make the right decision. And I, um, so that's it. Well, we discussed this at the, at the last meeting, Michael. I thought you won the debate with me when you asked administrators, well, when are we going to have more information, you know, that would l allow us to make a decision? And they said, you know, September. I mean, you know, no time between now and September are we re really going to have better information. So, um, you know, I'm, I, what I would, and I'm not really comfortable going forward with a budget that says, well, um, you know, we want to have this many teachers, we're going to assign to, to um, you know, to these grades, and then we want to have another $72,000 that will get assigned later if we need it. I think it's hard to go to take that kind of budget to the town council and to the voters. Um, so I think we, we, we're in a position where, you know, if the information isn't going to be forthcoming, you know, any time in the next, you know, to, by the, to the end of this school year, that if, if, if we think we want to add this resource, we ought to ask administrators to add the resource to the budget now in the place they think is most appropriate. As we do every year, at the beginning of the year, we make adjustments to meet student need um, where, that's, where that's necessary. And that, that, that happens every time we meet in August. We have a discussion about changing student need and, uh, and how we're going, we're going to reallocate resources to meet that changing student need. And that may happen again. Um, so I, I'd prefer to move forward with a, you know, firm, a firm concept of if, we, if we're using, if we're asking taxpayers for those funds, a, a firm concept of why we're asking for them and where we would be um, deploying that resource. Um, so I don't know, you know, whether administrators are prepared to answer that question tonight or or um, or not, but that's. You know that's that's the budget I would want to take to the, the budget I would want to take to the town council next week would say, uh, you know how we're going to how we expect based on the best information that we have at this time how we expect we would be using the funds we're requesting. And, uh, I agree with uh, John's uh, view that um, while, while there's always uncertainties, that, that doesn't mean you can't make a decision on the best information you have. At the present moment, and I think adding it or funding it through contingencies raises issues such as what would it be contingent upon, and it would it's not our administrators or superintendents' um, fault that there is some ambiguity in our guidelines. So I think as a board, um, yeah, we could be wrong, and if we allocate it to a, or if based on the recommendations from the superintendent district leadership team, if we allocate it to a grade that ends up having students move out, well, that, there's worse things that could happen in, in the district than you have a class that maybe has lower class size than it would otherwise, but I think at least it shows that we're trying to interpret our own guidelines and hopefully um, give some more clarity to um, the administrators and the superintendent, and as well as voters on what's actually in, in the budget. Um, so, you know, I would prefer to go ahead and allocate it and there may be citizens that aren't happy with that decision but at least we can say you have certainty um, based on what we know today um, and I think most people in the town know that um, there are changes every year and uh, just because a, a preliminary allocation was made students need to change and those resources will be reallocated if needed to meet the student needs as well so um, I have a question, but both of you guys are saying, are you saying add one teacher or add a teacher plus a 40,000 to the contingency? I just want to know what number you're talking about. Uh, I, I, I would say yes to, to a, yeah, a teacher and contingency increase. So, uh, and one additional teacher is 75 or? 71,000. 71 plus 40. So you're, you would, is that what you're saying, John, too? I, th I thought we were just talking about the first item, but we, if you want to well, bundle that, I like that this is the only issue that we really have, uh, but I may be wrong. And if I'm just trying to, because everybody says, I'm, I'm for doing this, well, what do you, I want to know what it is you're willing to do. You just explain it to me. I'll have to say, I too have a similar clarifying question around <clears throat> And philosophically speaking, yes, I think it's a great idea to plan for contingency, maybe if we need a teacher, 
you know, when as late as possible that we can make that decision to spend those funds, terrific, to have them in the wings in case. But exactly where in the budget are we planning to put those numbers and under what guidelines are there in existence, depending on where we put that amount in order to spend it? If, are there other rules around spending contingency funds? Where can that be placed? Uh, well, if it's in contingency funds, it, it's, it's in the, a line item called contingency. That, that's where it would be, where if you allocate the teacher based on recommendations, it would go. If it's in Pond Cove, it would go in Pond Cove salaries and benefits. And um, if it's not spent out of contingency, if we don't hire the teacher, where, does, where do the funds end up? Uh, if they were, if contingency funds were not spent, it would ends up in undesignated funds. Well, it stays in contingency, is what it does. Well, but, but, well, the, it would stay in contingency through the fiscal year, and if it was still unspent at the end of the fiscal year, it would be part of the undesignated right. fund balance. But for the time being, it's considered unspent contingency money. And, okay, so basically, in terms of form, um, Michael saying put seventy-one thousand into the pond code budget for a teacher and forty thousand into the contingency fund, and it may be used for an ed tech. It may be used for something else. At least that's what I understand, Michael. And I, I, well, I'm now clear on that. I'll be saying. very clear. We, we need to say, I believe we are going to add a teacher to the pond cove uh, grades. Uh, you know, one through four and say it's going to be in this grade so there's absolute certainty. And yes, if we have 14 kids move out of second grade or third grade or fourth grade, and we will make those adjustments. Um, you know, I don't think there's more clarity um, than that. You know, by putting contingencies, well, what is it, what's it contingent on? Um, Michael. Uh, I think you just really kind of expressed what my concern is around contingency and um, as I expressed the last time we just talked about this item I have really come around on it because it isn't an unknown it's a known we're going into this knowing we have the best information available at this time so I feel it's important for us to make a decision at this time with our information. And um, putting all of the money, the 71 plus the 40, into contingency really, I think, um, hobbles our administration because then we have to define, you know, at what point do we pull the trigger? What, you know, what are the definitions? Now we have to come up with a whole new, you know, a, a guideline. And uh, if we're waiting for the next time that we have really good information, which might be late August or early September, we are really, really going to be limiting our ability to get a teacher, frankly, uh, of the caliber that we would hope to get to teach our students. So I am in favor of adding a teacher at the Pond Cove School at a specific grade level, and then as we do every year, meet in August and assess student needs, things, things do change, but given the information that we have right now, we have to make the best decision we can with that information. And, and in terms of the, the contingent, the $40,000 contingency part of the proposal, that, those are contingency funds that get added to the existing contingency line item, and they would be spent uh, in the same way the contingency funds might, might be spent uh, in any given year, which is to say that if administrators felt there was a need to, to address um, an issue with contingency funding. If that's what the previous are saying, that's, then I understand it. The, the, they would, the it, administrators would approach the board and request to, to, to reallocate contingency funds towards a specific purpose. It's now crystal clear. And there is no, there's no, we're not defining a trigger or any particular, um, you know, time and place when that, those funds are going to be spent, that, that just, it just becomes part of the contingency line. So I would say, 
In echoing what Kate had said, for the first time in, in many years, the Pond Cove building has many different assets that it hasn't had over several years. And it does seem that there is potential for the need for another teacher in, especially it's been pointed out, the fourth grade, incoming fourth grade class. My concern about designating that amount of money even this early in the process and where we may know more even if it's as late as July, I don't know if I'd wait till August, but to, to have those funds especially earmarked so early when we don't have definitive numbers, but being ready to make a decision even after the budget passes on whether or not we do need in the end another teacher position in the Pond Cove, to me seems a more prudent course of action and leaves our options open in case enrollment fluctuates. Either way, it gives us an opportunity to hire a teacher should we need one or put it, keep it in the contingency and turn it over to undesignated funds at the end of the year if we don't need them. Then that, that, then that alternative would be to would be to add either seventy or one hundred and ten thousand dollars to the contingency line, as opposed to designating a a specific uh, right. teaching resource to to a specific. We're not place. closing under those under that scenario. To me, it doesn't close or or leave hanging a need in any particular place, but it also doesn't close the door to use those funds otherwise, should they turn out not to be needed. What is the downside of that? That's what I don't, um, I, I think the upside is that we're not firing a teacher, if um, chances are. And since it wasn't in the budget originally, what I'm saying is um, Meredith trusted in the administrators. Yes, we talked about it was written in it, but they, Kelly didn't say, I want this directly. We asked and she did say yes. You know, so that's where I'm coming from. It came from public, but which is great to have public input. But we have professionals here who are at. So that's where why I'm not sh why I want to make sure that um, this decision is a professional decision that is made by prof professionals, and that. Well, first of all, I would say that you know both the superintendent and the and the Ponco principal pointed out that the 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 risk around enrollment issues, yeah. uh, you know, K, K through six. Um, so that, that issue was brought forward in, in the very beginning of the budget process properly by administrator. Yes. Um, then I think what the risk is that the risk is that if we say, okay, we, you know, we had a contingency line item last year of $140,000. Uh, and this year we want, we want it to be $250,000. Then my question, you know, to the school board would be, well, you know, what's changed? What, what, why do you have so much more uncertainty this year than you had last year? And, and you know, I, I don't know that we have a good answer to that question. I think we have some uncertainty in enrollment projections, but I think we, we, have, we have no more, no, no new uncertainty this year. Um, and, and so I, I would be, to me it's difficult to explain that we have you know, twice as much uncertainty this year than we had last year. That's, that's what's hard for me. Okay. For me, the uncertainty seems to lie in that we have stretched our recommended class size to its, to its fullest. And the uncertainty or the risk being that didn't exist last year was that the one more or two more students in that particular grade level could push things over to an unacceptable class size limit in some of those grades. And so being able to have some sort of buffer in place, but not necessarily a commitment at this point in case that should happen. But then also planning so that if it doesn't happen, we can still use those funds in another way, which would be possible to lower the tax rate the following year or be better prepared for another unpredictable risk. Those are excellent points. <laughs> I agree. Can I just uh, ask, we, we, let's say we, we 
pass the budget to include an additional teacher. And lo and behold, all the, you know, the students come in at much lower than, and we don't really, we find we don't need that extra teacher at Blanca. What, hap what would happen? I'm just unclear what would happen at that point. I mean, are you saying you fire someone at that point, or? We're already, if the teacher's already under contract, we don't have the option to fire that teacher. Uh -huh. so we would still have that resource within the district. Yeah. But, um, and then if students were already assigned to classes, I would suspect that it would be difficult to break up classes and reassign classes mm -hmm. in order to use that resource in a different way. Right. Um, but if, if classes weren't assigned, I suppose you could use that resource in a different way mm -hmm. to do some of the push and support, for example, or. I think I look at it this way. There's, uh, you know, there, the guidelines are, there's variables <coughs> you go through. Using those variables, you make a decision. I don't think, um, you know, we already have two classes at Pond Cove that are projected to be above the guidelines. Um, you know, out of four classes, you know, I think it, it's hopeful, you know, that uh, if you're already starting above your own guidelines, you know, we can hope kids move out, but I, I don't think that's the most, uh, um, you know, uh, that's not the preferred model. I, I would say just allocate the resource and um, let's get on with it. Um, you know, I don't, I, there's always uncertainty and there's some magic enrollment um, paper we're going to get. It's not. It's never we're going to be off, but I just think if you look at the risks, you already have two classes, and say the risk goes the other way, you know, that, wow, maybe there's three classes that are over, and then you're, you don't have enough contingency funds, so, um, you know, I, I don't, I just say we allocate the resource upon Cove, um, you know, because I think uh, there are classes that are above the, the guidelines. I think it's important for people to understand that it's just, as, it's just as if we probably wouldn't re break up classes um, if we had a few, a few, you know, if we had smaller than usual classes. We don't break up classes when we have a few additional students either, um, which happens, you know, in every grade. I mean, every year in some grade, we get a, cl we get a, a class or two that has students over the class size. And, and, and um, one of the reasons is, you know, I don't think we view students as competitors with each other for, you know, for, for, for education, um, you know, that can only be had in, 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 you know, from a teacher in, in, you know, as one, one part of a, one slice of a pie. Um, I think students are in classrooms are contributing to each other's education um, in important ways uh, that we recognize in the district, which is why we don't break up classes if we have a, 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 you know, a, a class in third grade that's 20, 24 students or 23 students, we don't, we don't split them all up and hire another teacher. And we, wouldn't, we probably would be unlikely to do that, just as we would be unlikely to, if the class sizes got down to 16, to, to split them all up and hire a teacher and, and assemble them into larger classes. David? I'm listening to everybody, and I, my mind is moving towards the middle, but um, to me it sort of boils down to if you really think 22 is the guideline we have to abide by, we should hire the teacher. If you really think that, you should hire the teacher. I don't think that. I think it's a guideline for a reason. I think 23 is fine based on all available data, but if you think 22 is a guideline, put the teacher in. I mean, if you think that that is the absolute, and you put the teacher in. Because I agree with you, I don't think up or down a couple um, is going to make that. The risk is if you lose a lot and you, and you drop, you know, basically when you're adding the teacher, it's dropping down to 18 point something, 8.3, 0.4. 19. Excuse me? 19. 19. Well, then you have, again, on the other end, if you, if you drop, the, again, if you look at the, the general rule, is you don't go below 18. So then you run a risk that you get too small. But our problem right now is one too large. If that's, you believe the guideline. If you believe the guideline, you should vote for adding the additional teacher. I don't, but I can be persuaded otherwise. But I, I think the fluctuation over plus three students, minus three students, is not really the issue. The issue is whether or not 22 is something we should adhere to, 
or is it just a guideline? And something we should hear to, I think, then we add it. Is that clear? Yeah, I just want to point out there are four grade levels that are projected to be above the class size guidelines for next year. What I understood from the board's discussion about the guidelines was that you would put the priority on the younger learners, that you valued elementary learner, valued the elementary experience as a, a greater learning window, a more significant learning window in terms of class size than the window for older students. Um, you know, right now, if we were to place that resource, it would go in fourth grade where we are most above guidelines, though, again, we are also above guidelines in second grade. Um, so, you know, that's a, and if, again, if you're looking at sort of the earlier window for learning, that second grade class, if that were to grow by four students so that it is one above guidelines in every classroom, and the fourth, the existing third grade class were to drop by two or three students, then that teacher would probably be placed at the second grade level if that's, if that's what I'm understanding. Again, I think, I think the charge that we have administrators have is to view the grade levels, look at the demographics, look at the needs, and make appropriate staffing decisions. And, and I expect that that's what we will do. Um, again, right now, today, if you were to ask me where it would go, I would say fourth grade. But it's a very narrow difference between those grade levels and we could wind up with fifth or sixth grade sixth grade classes of 24 or 25 and I would be coming to you and saying how do we want to address this just as I did in October when we were over class size guidelines if we feel that there's a need for an additional resource but I think what you articulated is exactly what we would do uh, if it's allocated as of today if it would go to grade X and then you know enrollment changes move people move out in three months then if there's if that resource is reallocated and there's a tangible reason then I think everybody would support that so I think what you articulated and then if there's issues in fifth grade six other grades that's where you have contingencies or obviously if if you had you know less teacher needs at and third and fourth grade because everyone goes somewhere else then you know you would reallocate but i think we need to have a starting point to say here's where we're starting yes we adjust when we get new information and that's my intent was to make that clear because i heard a couple people say i don't know where that resource would go well right now that's where it would go well i just want to make it clear for the audience that if that's the decision that's not written stone. It's not like a line item in Congress's budget. This is not going, it, it, we have an overall budget. We're initially allocating it towards fourth grade. And if the time comes because there's needs in other grades that may get shifted, greater needs in other grades, I should say. I, I think that's only logical at that. But I think some, some people in the public don't understand that, that it is what happens. If we put it in the plan code budget right now for fourth grade, it, Facts change, it could shift to another grade and bunk over the ship to the middle school. Sometimes at this point, um, I'm not the parliamentarian here, but sometimes at this point we've done it, we can't vote, but we can do a show of hands, I think, a straw poll around an issue, and we've done that in the budget process before to try to identify, you know, sort of where, where the the majority of the board stands on an issue and then and then so that we can move sure you know on to the next piece i don't know what i don't want to cut off um debate if if we want to keep having having it but i i know it's late and sure we have more to do well how i frame it will <laughs> um <laughs> i can would the board, uh, is the, yeah, I would frame it, do you support adding additional teacher to Pond Cove at, and making the allocation, um, you know, based on what Superintendent Nado articulated? Yeah. Yes. And, and the, so you're leaving the, the um, contingency piece out for now? Uh, yes. Okay. So. So what, what is the um, motion adding, adding 71,000 to the Pond Court budget to, to be allocated? That based on what we have today, it would go to a grade four, mm -hmm. but that may change based on the most available, recent updated information at the time that decision needs to be made. What are our other options? Well, we vote first on that. Right. That's why I said how I frame it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's you're, it, with the first top, the first vote is to put it right. into the the budget. The Ponco budget for fourth grade teacher, or, or just Ponco budget. It has to. Go, does it have to go to the fourth grade? Um, and the line item is teachers. Okay. Ponco. And can it go if we find? I I understand that. If we find that all of our class sizes, I know, I'm just, if we find that all of our class sizes are at guideline, something happens, then that teacher would go to a push-in or something else in the... Again, I think it comes down to timing, Kate, so it's hard for me to answer that right now. But that, but like we wouldn't, um, that teacher would be an extra teacher for Pond Cove and could go fifth or sixth grade. Uh, you could move that teacher to as, you get the best information. Yeah, I mean, we essentially operate from a bottom line budget. So if we had 27 kids enrolled in sixth grade and we had 22 kids enrolled in fourth grade per class, then we would move that resource to sixth okay. grade. Great. But it, again. Yeah, I know. It is, and that's what we're voting on is the unknown. But it's the, I want to just make sure we're voting on, I, I want to, I'm trying to vote with this faith in the administration to do the right decision is what I'm trying to do. And if, uh, understand that the, um, our citizens understand that um, the administrators, you know, we have faith in our administrators. So, yes. All right, is everyone ready to vote? Uh, show of hands. In the affirmative. What are we voting on again? 71,000 being added to the Pond Co budget for a teacher. That can be which moved. right now would be designated at grade four, but it will right. depend on. Right. right. So, but it will depend on the variables at the time of okay. placement. That's exactly the motion. So if you were in support of the motion, you would raise your hand at this time. <laughs> if you're not. That's five. Five. Okay. Moving rapidly along um, to contingency, given it's a related um, consideration. Uh, just there's, uh, we have received emails on, you know, um, what are the plans for the contingency funds? By their nature, contingency funds are there because you don't know what may happen. So um, you may have changes in enrollment. You may have a physical uh, plant building issues. You may have instructional support needs. You may have a curtailment um, from the state. So contingency funds are by their nature contingent on something if you knew was going to happen, you wouldn't call them contingency funds. Um, so uh, the last board meeting we had uh, proposed, discussed, considered adding 40,000 to the contingency line item, which uh, would take us from 140,000 to 180,000. Um, any comments, discussions um, on that item? I, I would just comment that uh, I'll, I'll support this item, um, but um, I'm supporting it in the spirit that this is, these are contingency funds, uh, and that this $40,000 is no different from any other uh, money in the contingency line item, and, and um, you know, I don't want there to be any confusion about, you know, there being specific triggers attached to the spending of these so I, I support it because I think we have sufficient uncertainty in a number of areas um, of our budget to support it, um, and that's why I support it. Elizabeth? I just want to echo John's sentiment that um, I would support the additional funds, but with the understanding that contingency means contingency, that it's for unplanned, unforeseen circumstances. Dan? Uh, I actually, I, I agree with John in the way he phrased it. I would support 40,000 being added to the contingency fund because I, I firmly believe that all we need is one event in our capital plan and we're gonna need every penny. There, there's too many years we've had, I've been arguing for a larger contingency fund, whether it goes to a, ultimately to a ed tech or to 
a oven that blows up or a boiler or whatever, I think we need more in a contingency. So I would echo John's view that that is a pure contingency, which means it should be funded, it should be spent in whatever way is deemed appropriate as necessary for our school, and I would support it. I think we uh, are all in agreement. Um, and the last uh, item, um, obviously, if there are other items we want to revisit, um, we can. To carry forward, uh, the original uh, budget had a $500,000 revenue carry forward. Um, just as a follow-up, the uh, $400,000 um, revenue would be $100,000 less. The net remaining undesignated fund balance would be approximately 2% uh, of 2013 14 school expenditures, which is, uh, you know, recommended or the low end of the recommended range from discussions uh, or communications we've received from um, auditors. Um, so that is how that number uh, we, we came, or the, the reasoning behind the number um, of 400,000. Uh, any questions, thoughts? No. Oh, David. I was going to make a motion. Uh, oh, whatever, whatever you want to do. I, well, we don't have to, if, you know, I think we're agreeing, but we don't have to have a motion on well, those. I things. support the concept of increasing our undesigned funds back to to 500,000, not spending 100,000 this year and keeping it in undesignated funds. Spending that money. So making, in other words, making the undesignated funds go from 400 to 500. Uh, 500 to 400. Sorry. Gotcha, I'm with you. Um, any other? I, I guess, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm uncertain about this one. I'd like to hear, hear you articulate what you think is the rationale for this. The, the rationale, uh, you start with uh, a balance in your undesignated fund um, that's estimated as of the 13-14 year end. Um, the recommendation, that's reserves. Um, the, the recommendation is to have a remaining reserve balance after you recognize, allocate revenue to the 14-15 year of uh, 2 to 3 percent. Um, if we allocated five hundred thousand dollars in revenue, we would be below the two percent. What number? What would be our number? Um, it would be I don't know one one point six one point seven percent. Um, and if you do so, this the f reducing from five hundred to four hundred would put us at the two percent or the low end of the recommended balance um, or percentage of prior year school expenditures. The, the recommendation that you're talking about is uh, the accountant's recommendation for um, for a municipal school district, or is this for a standalone school district? Uh, for for a municipal school district. If it was, um, because we're part of the town, there's a greater, there's another uh, expenditure ratio used at the town level. So if we were a standalone district, it would probably be a higher recommended amount. But for our school district, the recommended range is two to three percent. A range of two to three percent. Um, and if we did five hundred thousand, the remaining balance would be below the the two percent. It's hard. You could say, well, let's lower the tax increase and just do 500,000. I would say 500,000 is the, I believe it's the all time high revenue recognition. And you can, you know, this time next year, you may be saying, wow, you know, something happened. I wish I had a, a way to offset uh, the tax increase. So. Right, but we're, we're you might, you could also say, Recognizing an additional hundred thousand dollars this year is a reasonable thing to do in a year in which we're adding a major program in in, in full day kindergarten, which carries a one hundred thousand dollar one time cost, and we would in essence be carrying forward uh, those funds to cut co to cover 
that one-time cost of st the startup costs, in effect, of full-day kindergarten. And then we would be, next year, we would, we would not be able, obviously, we can't continue to recognize that. We're, we're projecting it, I think, bringing forward $350,000, so we'd, we'd see a decrease of $150,000 in that line. Um, but we'd also have a, a, that would be offset in part by a decrease in, in the, 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 you know, the spending that reflects the startup cost of full-day kindergarten of $100,000. And I, I don't, uh, you know, I think those are valid points. My thought is if you recognize $500,000 this year, it would be very difficult to get comfort that you would carry, be able to carry forward, you know, $350,000 next year. In other words, if you do 500000 this year, what if the number next year you can only carry forward is, uh, or recognize the revenue is 100000 the delta would then be 400000 I mean, you know, unfortunately, we're operating without a without a retired business manager, right. who would typically, at this point in the process, I would turn to Pauline and ask Pauline, um, and we can't, and we don't have. I'm sorry, Dave. Having spoken to Pauline recently, I can share her view. Uh, are you channeling helpful. Pauline? Well, um, I, sh sure. <laughs> Uh, I mean, Pauline did this for 17 years. Pauline worked in the development of this budget. Pauline felt comfortable that carrying forward 500,000 would not negatively impact the district moving forward. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm not disagreeing with Michael's point. I'm, I'm sharing her view as someone who has managed the funds in this district for a long time as part of a municipal school district. Um, and our plan, our three-year budget plan last year, called for us to carry forward a greater amount of money this year because of the fact that we were losing the Medicaid revenues. So that was planned and intentional. Next year's plan calls for us to carry forward a smaller number um, because it was sort of stepping down that loss of Medicaid revenues. David. I think there's a reason for 2%. We're at the low end if we do it at 2%, which is um, using only 300,000 rather than 400,000. We're spending savings. I have to keep saying that. We have spending savings for a one-time account. That's not what you do. We, we should be, if we're going to have full-day kindergarten, we should be willing to pay for it. And by willing to pay for it, we charge the taxpayer. And if the taxpayer doesn't support, they don't support. They will, but it's an appropriate, it's an ongoing operating expense. I could pick many one-time items in this budget and you could claim it's a one-time. That doesn't mean that you use your undesignated reserves for it. The problem with using undesignated reserves is you're spending your savings in any given year. It has the effect of increasing your risk the following year, increasing your risk this year, because we can tap into those funds with town council permission. And more importantly, it lowers our, our, we have to ask for a higher tax increase next year. You say it's one time, but why not have the people pay for it as it goes? That's what we're doing. The fact that we're drawing down 400,000 is in essence paying for 400,000 from savings of our operating costs. We're already spending at this, if we do it at 400,000 or 300,000, we're spending savings to cover operating costs. I, I hear you loud and clear. I think it's the fifth, fifth time we've year in a row that we've done budgets together, David, and every single one of those years, uh, our budget has been um, closed with the use of one-time funds. There was federal stimulus funds, there were Medicaid funds, there were, there were, there's been a whole, I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but there was, a, there, every year we've had one, and the question is, do we put an end to that practice this year or next year, really, well, the, what we're saying. And this year we have a, 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 a significant one-time expenditure in order to launch a program. Well, on your theory, we should have, like a lot of towns did, we should have spent all of the monies we got from federal stimulus and our Medicaid money. Instead, we stretched it out over three or four years so we can correspondingly have tax increases that we thought were reasonable and acceptable, yet raise our revenue enough to meet our future operating and our current operating expenses. The fact we were able and were proven to spread that out over three or four years doesn't mean that we should keep doing it. Once we drop below the 2%, I say, that's the time you don't do it. That's what the accountants say. I just say two to three, but drop a vote, you don't do it. Yeah, we had a lot of money in reserves because we got one-time funds. Remember what happened last year when we got one-time funds from the state of Maine? It made our, our tax increase be 1.9, and now we're going to have to find that money this year 
because we spent one-time funds last year. That's what will happen next year. And I think we have to keep it at least what the accountants say it should be, which is 2%. And that's the minimum. The lower end, I should say, the lower end. Okay. Well, I've said my, my piece, and so I'll just listen to other members of the board. Okay. Um, I would go with the recommendation of Pauline and the accountants because education is changing. You can see the three... They're recommending different things. I'll shoot. <laughs> <laughs> they were... You have to pick one. All right, so Michael's <laughs> recommending 2% and Pauline's recommending... One and a half. One and a half, which actually gives us more money. That's where my problem is. Is the one and a half more in our... More revenue, but less savings. And less revenue next year. We oh. have to increase our taxes to make up for what we spend in savings this year. The education is changing, and however the, uh, the, the number does it, every, the, with the governor in place and with, um, we've been building and we need more money every year we're going to be asked to do more, um, to need, we're going to need more money in our operating budget. And I think it's our job to teach um, town council, and town council is not going to be happy about our number at all. I think we've done a really nice job being as prudent as we can, and we've come to, um, in the past, we have frozen budgets, and we've done everything we need to do. But the fact is, we have these huge um, obligations with education, and we're, it, we're not quite done um, with that. We're not quite done with the decisions. We have a couple more things. So, so, 2% is the lowest, is what the Michael is proposing. And what I'm proposing. Pauline is proposing. Well, well Pauline's not here. Well, and uh, Meredith. Pauline is here. Meredith, here. Yes, but Pauline worked on this budget, and uh, Meredith has been consulting. Has been consulting. And so, um, and she recommended that we should do, or Meredith, you recommended in the budget that we should do what? What, what was your number? We were originally, the original proposal calls for us to carry forward 500,000 of the undesignated fund balance. Is that the two and a half percent number? What's one and a half. One and a half. So, the one, the one comment that I have here yes. is, um, Sorry, sort of feeds into why I was proposing to set aside, or at least part of the reason why I was proposing to set aside um, the funds for uh, a potential teacher hire into the undesignated fund, I'm sorry, into our contingency fund. Because should we not need the teacher, should the numbers fed out, say, in July, that indeed it's a luxury but not a necessity to have another teacher in the district. We could at least put those into the contingency fund, and if we don't spend it out of the contingency fund, then it could roll over into our undesignated fund balance, which we are robbing Peter to pay Paul at this point. However, with the 500000 putting it into the budget to pay for what it is we're proposing this year, um, I see it as a, 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 a necessary evil. I've been a proponent of making sure we have a sufficient undesignated fund balance should we need emergency funding, but we have a lot of demands on this year's budget, more so than in other years, including um, the uh, increasing enrollment, increasing, increasing class sizes, um, as well as not only the six enrollees in charter schools and um, our continued um, cutting back from state funding. Those are just realities that I don't think will be going away anytime soon. Um, so at some point, something has to give. So having at least $500,000 to be able to offset some of the proposals in this year's budget is helpful. I'm concerned, again, still, at designating out $140,000 for um, let me be clear, I'm all for whatever teachers are needed in our classrooms to make those classrooms work efficiently, especially, as I've said before, at the lower grade levels, where earlier education and intervention can lead to better outcomes later in our district. However, there's many great needs that are stressing on our budget right now, and they're not going to go away next year either. 
So that's a long-winded way to say um, I propose, I support the proposal of putting the 500000 into this year's budget. Um, I, over the last 11 years, the average designated, undesignated fund balance is 394000 with using the 500000 this year, that puts our fund balance at a 340000 by all means not the lowest, but it is definitely below the average. Um, but we will have to do some even tougher decisions next year should we not have any undesignated funds left over. And I think uh, your last comment is the way I see it. You know, there, uh, it's hard. This is hard to do. Who wants to say let's have a bigger tax increase than we would if we um, had 100000 more in revenue? Uh, but I think we want to have a sustainable district where um, you, to the extent possible, you can minimize big tax volatility and, um, you know, I think the budget this year will stand on its own merits. Yes, the tax increase is greater than last year, but actually spending growth is, is lower than last year. So I think there's clear reasons on why um, the other revenue items, we you know, Medicaid revenue we lost. Um, there's no Medicaid revenue in the future, um, so it's even more important, I think, to have a uh, healthy undesignated fund balance because Medicaid revenue is gone and who knows what's going to happen with state revenue. So um, I just look at 2% for me is the, is the line, or I don't want to say that, uh, is uh, I don't want to go below 2% because if we do, I don't think we'll have 350000 to allocate next year. And I think we're increasing our contingency fund, which gives us a little bit more buffer. Um, but you know, I think if two percent's the the minimum, and you know, then that's the reason it's a minimum is that that's what you shouldn't go below. Um, so, and, and I acknowledge it's hard to say. You know, we could have had a lower tax increase, but a year from now we may be saying, "Oh my gosh, that would have been great to have a hundred thousand dollars to offset." Um, so why don't we all have views on it? Why don't we vote on this one? Um, and at this time of night, this has happened before. So let me tell you what your vote would mean. Uh, the um, if you vote for, do you uh, support allocating five hundred thousand dollars in revenue from the undesignated funds? If you put your hand up and say yes. That means you'll, you'll have less remaining, a, a smaller undesignated fund balance. Okay. So you're making a motion in, 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 in basically in favor of the existing. I'm not, I'm just saying with, just so everyone understands. So if you vote for 500,000, your the remaining undesignated fund balance will be lower or below the 2%. Why, why don't we make it simple? No, I don't know that. It's too late tonight to make it something. 2%. Either you support or don't support 2% in undesignated reserves. Well, why don't we just say the 500000 then lessens the cost of some of the other programs and it things that we've added to the budget? I, I, I kind of thought 2% two, 2 versus understanding whether I forget it. Right. So I, I agree with my framing. So it's yeah, just framing the exactly. Just, That's my point. So, why don't we go with what? Um, What's your motion? Option Michael? B one. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Option B one. What's Here that? We go. <laughs> this sheet carried you, forward four hundred. Right. In this one, it has four hundred thousand dollars. That means we drop below two percent. So you just so, change your no, motion. No, no, no. Yeah, you just that, changed uh, your motion. He wasn't making a motion. But I want to understand. Does everyone understand if it's a higher revenue? Allocation, you have less remaining than the fund balance. Does everyone get that? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so the motion is, and I'll just make it do you support allocating $500,000 uh, in revenue for the 2014 15 budget, meaning that the remaining undesignated fund balance may be below 2%?
right. So then the, the next, I'm sorry, how many people do that? It's three. It's three. 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 All right, the next uh, motion is, do you support allocating $400,000 in revenue from the undesignated fund balance, which would put our remaining uh, fund balance, and I hope I don't have to say fund balance again for a long time, uh, <laughs> would be 2%, so raise your hand. All right. Um, so we went through, uh, so uh, B1, and help me out here, that reflects all the changes. It does. So B1 that you have, hopefully before you, mm -hmm. includes A1, which was the health insurance, the charter tuition change, the additional um, teacher at Conco, the 40000 added to contingency and a carry forward at $400,000. If you flip on the back, that is the tax impact and spending or uh, expenditure information. Uh, before we close the workshop, David, did you have some thoughts? No, I, I, I just want to make sure, uh, when you say close the workshop, we're then going to go in and vote on the, yes. the gross figure, which will incorporate B1. B1, which is reflective of, of the majority of our very straw indication votes, Correct. whatever. Okay. Because I have a different way to vote on that. So is everyone good to leave uh, the budget workshop and get back to uh, item 5B? We'll start with item 7. May I have a motion? On item seven. I move we adjourn the budget workshop and re-enter regular business meeting. I second the motion. All, right. All those in favor. Okay. All right. We are going to go back to item 5E. Um, are you prepared, Meredith? I'm fully prepared. My only question might be, would you want to take items 8A and B so that some of these people who are still here have the option to go? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Have the vote. I would agree to vote on the budget now. Um, yes, I'd be happy to do that. Um, in that case, item 8A, may I have a motion? Go ahead, John. Go ahead, David. Go ahead. All right. I move that we adopt the 2014-2015 Community Services Budget and the related revenue components expenditures in the amount of $1,695,800, revenues in the amount of $1,240,800, and local appropriation in the amount of $455,000. Second. Is there any discussion? Just for clarification, I assume that these numbers add up to what we just indicated. Us that we're we're going to add a, a, a uh, community. This services. is community services. Oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. <laughs> and you usually pay such close attention to this. Yeah, I'm tired. My speech wore me out. Um, is there any further discussion? <laughs> okay. I just want to thank uh, Director Packett and um, and Here. the Community Services Advisory Team uh, who came out who came out and who worked very hard with, with the, uh, Director Packett on this um, budget and and uh, came out in in support of the budget and and uh, I appreciate their involvement um, and the hard work that went into the budget. So thank you. I'd also want to add that I I think this year it's an excellent budget. Um, all the right calls were made. Um, I think it's, it's something I can fully 100% support. Any further discussion? No. Nope. All those in favor? 7 0. <clears throat> All right, item 8B. I move that we adopt the 2014 2015 school board budget and the related revenue components. Expenditures in the amount of $23,240,174. Revenues in the amount of 
$5,579 and local appropriation in the amount of $20,234,595. Okay. I second the motion. Okay, is there any discussion? Can I now interject a correct question? Yes. Yes. I assume that I haven't followed your numbers. That, this, that those numbers basically reflect the adding of an additional teacher for the Pond Cove budget. Well, I'll say uh, forty thousand to contingency and doing a carry forward of four hundred thousand. Correct. And uh, David on the back has the tax impact information. Um, I, I would say that in spite of having voted, 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 Jesus, Jesus, by the way. Uh, differently during it. I, I, I do think that this is a good budget. I do think it's reasonable compromises. I, I think it's a close call on the Pond Cove teacher. I now, uh, I, I will fully support this entire proposal. Thank you, David. Elizabeth? Uh, I'd like to extend my appreciation to building administrators, department heads, and Superintendent NATO for the immense effort and time put into this budget. Thank you all for your collaboration and hard work on behalf of the children of this community. I would also like to thank the members of the public who added their thoughts, concerns, and ideas to this process. An informed, engaged, and supportive community is key to the success of our schools. I'm voting in favor of this budget because I believe it supports the initiatives of our strategic plan and moves the district forward while being mindful of the burden placed upon our taxpayers. I'm excited about the direction we as a district are going as a result of the planning in this budget, such as professional development opportunities around differentiation, among other things, all day kindergarten at Pond Cove, advisory at the middle school, and much, much more. It appropriately addresses concerns, moves us toward our goals, and adds to contingency for unforeseen financial issues. I myself and we all have given careful thought and consideration to every line and implication, and I support this budget. Thank you. Elizabeth. Thank you. Any other comments? I would just like to say I too support this budget. I wish that um, when it comes to building uh, the character and academics and um, even the athletic pursuits of our young people in this district that they, we didn't have to have a budget at all, that we could just give everything that every classroom teacher ever desired and needed. And but unfortunately, that's not our reality. And we've definitely struggled through some of these issues in the budget. And I truly appreciate my colleagues on the board for their collegial um, debate of the issues. Um, things aren't taken lightly um, by any amount. Um, I support this budget wholeheartedly. I do wish we had more money in the budget for every single one of our um, wish list needs, but I think that we've come to some prudent um, landings. So thank you for your hard work, one and all, including the district leadership team and from all of those that we've heard from, from the community during this process. Thank you. Susanna? Yeah. Um, I, I also want to say that I definitely support this budget um, wholeheartedly also. Um, and I, I hope uh, that going forward, after we present this to the town council and, and hopefully uh, to the voters, that all the energy um, that we saw and the passion that we saw from parents involved in um, letting us know their thoughts and their opinions on things like class size will uh, unify us um, so that we can make this uh, a reality in the, in, the, in the budget. Thank you. So, Dave. Thank you. Um, I, I do support the current budget. I do want to note that we started off in a hole that we had to fill. We had to make up about 1% from last year. Roughly, that's about $200,000, uh, Meredith? Yes. Uh, plus, we got whacked by about 90000 from the state. We got another 60000 we got hit with. So a fairly good chunk, uh, about 250000 and our numbers are going to be off a little bit, but a, a fairly significant portion of our increase is something over which we had absolutely no control and that would have been just to get us to where we were last year. Uh, so, 
if you run the numbers, which I'm sure we will, that our actual increase caused by this budget in, uh, minus the whole head to fill is actually smaller than when it appears. But I'm comfortable that under my rule that if we need to do it, uh, we should be we should pay for it, and if we believe we should pay for it, we should be able to sell it. And it's a budget I believe we can sell for the best interest of our school district, and taking into consideration um, slightly higher than what a taxpayer may like, but it's what we need to do, and I find it acceptable to ask the taxpayer for it. Thank you, David. Michael, I'll try to be uh, crisp. <laughs> Uh, the proposed budget supports the educational needs of all students, moves the district forward, and allocates resources consistent with the goals of the strategic plan and mission and vision statement. From a top-down perspective, the budget themes to me are stable enrollment after nearly a decade of enrollment declines and higher than expected enrollment in 2013 and 2014. After several years of staff reductions, total staff will be stable, excluding full-day kindergarten, and a slight increase when full-day kindergarten is included. From a bottoms-up perspective, through creative resource sharing and tremendous teacher and administrator energy, we are enriching, enriching educational programs at all levels. At Pond Cove, world language and culture will be introduced in the first grade at no additional cost. A full-time literacy specialist will work with readers in the high school requiring additional support at no additional cost. An advisory period for seventh and eighth graders will be created at the middle school to provide additional mentoring and connectedness to the school, consistent with many of the strategic planning goals and the survey we reviewed tonight. Uh, additionally, a half-time social work position will be funded by federal grants at the high school, providing additional resources to students facing complex social issues and the challenges of just being a teenager. Providing opportunities for students to pursue their passions is an important strategic planning goal and something we often hear, about, uh, hear from families in the community. The addition of choral music during the day at the middle school, investment in the district's robotics program, an after-school Mandarin Chinese exploratory course, investments in engineering-related programs such as computer-aided design platforms at the middle school create additional opportunities for st students to pursue and nurture their passions. Only a few more paragraphs, I promise. The 2014-15 budget also includes investments to maintain our buildings and facilities, which will reduce the risk of major, ex more expensive renovations in the future. A new boiler at, the pond, at Pond Cove in the middle school will reduce carbon emissions, reduce fuel costs, and offer for compatibility for alternative fuel sources in the future. Fuel savings, project, I'm sorry, projected fuel savings from this investment will more than offset related borrowing costs. Obviously, we have mandated state changes in curriculum and standards, which will require increased investments in assessments, professional development, and increased parental dialogue and opportunities for discussion. The budget includes the implementation of full-day kindergarten in 2000 and 2015 for all students, two teaching positions, startup costs for books, supplies, and teaching tools, and space reconfiguration will require approximately $240,000 in total spending. After an admittedly, admittedly rocky pilot introduction in 2013 and 2014, the district is poised to implement the program in the upcoming year for all students. While the district hopes to realize savings from full-day kindergarten in the long term, there will be no resource uh, decreases uh, to early intervention or support programs such as reading recovery or the math lab in K through 2. Uh, through thoughtful planning and without offsetting full-day kindergarten costs with program or resource reductions in other areas, total spending will increase 3.2% which is actually lower than last year's 3.5% spending increase. With the state, projected, uh, state revenue projected to decline in 2014-15 and a $200,000 decline in Medicaid revenue, the total local tax increase will, it will exceed spending growth in the upcoming year. But please remember last year, the local total tax increase was less than the spending group growth. I look at it this way. Over the last two years, the average 
annual tax rate increase, increase will, is approximately or would have been approximately 3%, which is roughly in line with spending to what uh, council or uh, school board member Hellman uh, often articulates is, um, you know, the volatility in state revenue is hard to manage, uh, but over a multi-year basis, you'll see that our spending and local tax rates uh, are more comparable. So I support the budget and thank all of you for a long, grueling budget process. And um, I look forward to uh, getting hearing from support from the broad community who we know are very passionate about education and I expect them to show the passion as they uh, step forward to make their voices heard uh, on this budget. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Is there any further comment, Kate? Um, I support this budget. I uh, want to make sure that it's the administration that um, all know that how much we appreciate the work that you put into this. It is as you um, educate us about what, it, um, what our district needs and how it works. We do, I, I do my best to ask questions to make sure that I can answer the questions in public and um, I don't always do that gracefully, but I just want to uh, tell you all that I appreciate this work, especially uh, Meredith as you pull it all together. And um, like the rest of you, um, I think that this is a, a, I love that the citizens came out and spoke so um, that got there, it was a wholehearted discussion. And we had some high schoolers, some middle schoolers, and mostly Pond Cove, but the energy, even though it's conflict, isn't always a bad thing. You know, we learned more, and I think um, when you're spending money and you're putting uh, energy into children in the future, that it should be um, a questioned procedure. And so thank you all for letting me ask the questions and um, answering them. I support the budget. Thank you, Kate. Seth, did everyone have a chance to speak then? Can I do a PS? Because Michael's, I want Michael's well, last sentence is the best. Our average over the last two years is 3%. It's extremely reasonable in any environment. And I will add one major benefit we're adding to our school district at no cost. And that is dramatically increasing our math being taught at, at middle school to the 21st century so our kids can compete. And that's being done at no cost to this budget. Thank you, David. Uh, so I, I, it's late, and, uh, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't also thank the members of the district leadership team who, who worked very hard on putting this all together. I know you do a lot of work before we even see it. Uh, and you're here late, uh, one, other, one additional night um, as we go through our process. And I, I really appreciate all of the work that you all have put into it. Um, so thank you. I also want to um, thank, um, in particular, the, the dozens of teachers um, and community members who participated in our strategic planning process. Uh, the district is, will, by the end of this year, have a five-year uh, a strategic plan for the first time in, in to my knowledge and in, 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 in many years anyway in Cape Elizabeth I'm not aware of an earlier one um, it may exist um, and uh, that that process involved uh, many many teachers community members and stakeholders who came forward um, to bring out the, the, the key themes that have informed um, this budget I also want to thank uh, Paulina Portria, who came, <clears throat> came uh, out of retirement many times um, during this process to, um, to help us uh, understand the numbers and, and, and you know, become confident in what we were putting forward. Um, and finally, I want to also thank the many community members who have gotten involved in the, in the school budget process, maybe for the first time um, this time around, some of whom are still here tonight. Uh, after 10 o'clock, um, and uh, I, I have become acquainted with many more members of our community than I had known before, and I appreciate <laughs> all of those opportunities to get to know uh, my neighbors and, um, and, and uh, fellow uh, people with passions for the school. Um, so thank you all, and uh, I'm looking forward to supporting this budget. Thank you. That said, all those in favor? Seven zero.
All right. How are we doing? <laughs> Do we need a five-minute break? Do you want a five-minute break? No. No. <laughs> we'll say that. We're almost done. With Perseverance <laughs> is one of our... All right. If, 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 to develop in the district, so. if uh, anyone does not have a particular interest in one of the items left on our agenda and feels the need to depart, we won't be offended. Um, we know we it's We can late. skip D until next time. You'd be disappointed, I think, if you did. Um, item C, may I have a motion? I move we appoint Amy Lombardo to the Community Services Advisory Commission for 2014 through 2016. Is there a second? I second the motion. Okay, is there any discussion? I know it's late. I'm just going to say we're excited to have this person express her interest. There are lots of um, interesting and significant issues coming down the pipe, and so the community is lucky to have Ms. Lombardo on board. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Okay, item six, I'm sorry, 8D. May I uh, have a motion? Sure, I move we approve the proposed 2014-2015 academic year calendar. All right, is there any discussion? Meredith? I can just share um, a few changes that have been made since the draft was shared at the February meeting, um, which were based on some um, continuing dialogue with teachers within the district and some um, feedback and some differentiation to meet needs across different buildings. Most of those don't impact um, student instructional time. They have to do with the use of the what have been historically professional Mondays and some reallocation of those to be different teacher days. So you see that in the bottom right of the draft calendar. Um, the other changes include the addition of two early release days for next school year's calendar, one immediately preceding the February vacation and one immediately preceding the April vacation to allow for some district-wide professional development. Um, and I'll speak about this issue again in a little while, but one of the challenges that we have is we have very few um, district-wide professional development days, very few district-wide hours that are available to us to do some of the outstanding curriculum work that we have to do to continue the work on the strategic plan. Um, so this additional time I think will be much appreciated by our faculty and um, will go a long way towards helping us move toward the achievement of our goals. Thank you. Are there any questions or discussion? All those in favor? All right, item 8B. I have a motion. I move we approve the athletic, extra, and co curricular staff nominations as listed in item 8E of tonight's agenda. Second. Perfect. Perfect. Is there any discussion? None except to say that was a perfect motion. I like it. Sorry? I've been listening. <laughs> Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Item 8F, may I have a motion? I move that we approve the following personnel nominations for the 2014-2015 school year. I'm going to butcher her name, Stephanie Buffar, Perfect. Middle School Guidance, and Chris Turner, Middle School Computer Technology. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Okay, we're going to go back now to item five. Moving right along. <laughs> Moving right along to item five, B. E. <laughs> okay. Um, so I have one resignation to report. We've received a letter of resignation from high school science teacher Susan Rose. So we'll be advertising for that um, position in the near future. Thank you. And no retirements. No retirement. Okay. Uh, then item F, the superintendent's report. Okay. Try to keep it brief. I can beat David's 10 minutes, I promise. Um, I'm going to start with 
to wake a chief sheriff. Just announcing that um, Pond Cove received a letter of recognition from the Commissioner of Education. I'm recognizing them as a high performance reward school. I'm just going to share a clip from that letter. This designation achieved by only 19 other main schools recognizes that Pond Cove Elementary has consistently achieved high performance in meeting state and federal accountability standards for English language arts and mathematics. Additionally, Pond Cove Elementary has met or exceeded annual measurable objectives AMO's targets in math and reading for the whole school and each subgroup has met or exceeded the school's average daily attendance targets for grades three through eight or the graduation rate for the whole school, not applicable, and all subgroups and is not in the 25% of schools with the highest within school achievement gaps in math or reading. So um, uh, it's a great recognition for um, the hard work of teachers that has gone on um, through the years here and um, we appreciate the letter. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, let's see. Since we last met, I had the opportunity to attend our high school band and chorus um, concert, where there were many, sort of, in addition to the ensemble performances, a lot of um, solo performances and um, pieces that were um, really fun to watch. Um, nice to see students in a different um, light and pursuing some of their passions. So thank you to Joanne Lee and um, Tom Ozot for that work. Um, this past weekend, Anything Goes was performed at the middle school, and again, about 60 students from our middle school, or about a tenth of our student population, participated in the performance in one way or another. So thank you to um, Steve Price and again, Joanne Lee, for serving as the musical director. On Sunday, some members of this board, along with some members of our administrative team, participated in the World Affairs Council Trivia Night. I'll say that we had a good showing. So right, I see the smiles over there. We did tie with the high school social studies department for second place, but congrats to the UNAM team for uh, pulling off the victory. But, but it was, a, again, a great opportunity, a full cafeteria of community members and citizens really supporting um, the great work that the World Affairs Council does and um, learning in the process. I think we all can say we learned some things <laughs> on Sunday evening. Um, on Thursday, I'll be speaking with the Chamber of Commerce about our strategic plan and some of the work going on in the district. Tomorrow, the middle school band and chorus um, concert will be held in the cafetorium at 7 o'clock. People are nodding at me. That's yes. a good sign. Um, on Thursday evening, the film Girl Rising will be screened at um, the high school in the auditorium also at 7 p.m., which is um, being sponsored by a couple of our students just to sort of raise awareness about some of the issues going on for girls in other parts of the world. Saturday will be our second annual Author Fest event at Cape Elizabeth High School from 10 to 2. So be there. There are 35 plus authors and illustrators coming from across New England and it's a great opportunity for um, people of all ages to have conversations with real writers. And um, the authors and illustrators range from sort of pre-K books through uh, young adult and adult titles. It is National Volunteer Week, so I want to recognize the volunteers who um, attend our schools and help make all of the work that we do much easier in many, many ways. And thanks to Gail Schmader for the work that she does in coordinating um, the volunteer efforts. The 17th of April, next Thursday, week from Thursday, will be an early release for the district. So that's roughly 11.30 at the middle and high school and roughly noontime at the elementary school. So it's a K-12 early release. That was um, a decision that the board made at a recent workshop. And again, a request to the district administrative team to really help us do some of our work around um, the strategic plan pieces and um, looking at sort of the overarching picture we have around the many changes on the horizon for us as a district. Board members are invited to join us for that day um, and we'll also be joined by our student um, leaders from the middle school and high school um, and possibly our fourth grade student council reps as well. well maybe two weeks ago now it's a little bit of a blur. Um, the maker celebration was held at Pond Cove Elementary and that was the celebration of um, coordinated by our robotics person, Evan Thayer, included some of our high school science teachers and students, a lot of local business partners. Students had a chance to see 3D printers at work. Some of our high school students made snow um, outside of the elementary school. We were in a workshop, so none of us were able to attend that evening, but um, it received some rave reviews and I think has, again, helped to really build some excitement about STEM work. Len Cabral wrapped up his um, time in our schools with a community performance. And um, thanks again to Seif for sponsoring his work with our elementary and middle school students. 
It is Autism Awareness Month, and I know Pond Cove is working um, particularly on some inclusion and acceptance of students with autism, both inside school as well as in the broader community. Our gifted and talented application, you heard a little bit about earlier, was approved on March 19th, and we'll be adding that to um, the curriculum instruction part of our website. Oh my goodness, the eyes are really going. Um, we are in, still in the process of interviewing um, for our business administrator. Hope to have a finalist for you at the next meeting. And we're beginning our process to hire a technology director as well for next year. We have sent out our professional development survey to staff across the district to help inform um, professional development offerings for the future. Again, that's an area that um, we've heard loud and clear from folks that they'd, they'd like to be better tailored to their particular needs. So we want to honor that. Our evaluation committee received news today that the legislature has adopted a rule. So the rules may actually be in place. Um, they are waiting the, awaiting the governor's signature. Um, but some one of the pieces that has been proposed in the rule changes is that the obligation to pilot a system for the upcoming school year has been removed. So it gives a little bit more time for system development. Um, one of the challenges that's incorporated in that is that there are some changes to the way the committee has to be comprised and developed, which include um, potentially a vote locally. So. Um, while we've done some work, we want to make sure we address that outstanding issue before we go much further down this road of developing the evaluation system. I think those are most, no, no, I'm not done yet. Um, Pond Cove kicked off National Poetry Month this month by celebrating Poem in Your Pocket Week. I know um, if you're a parent of an elementary student, you had poems read to you at home recently. <laughs> So thank you to the parent volunteers and staff who helped greet our students and pass out those poems. Um, last night, Stan Davis was at Pond Cove, thanks to some funding from CIF, and he worked with grade level teams and the Pond Cove Action Team and held a question and answer session with parents last evening in the Media Center. And today and tomorrow, Jarrett Krasaska, Krasaska, Krasaska? I think, I think I was corrected by my child this morning and that it is Krasaska. Uh, but he is in, he's spending, he's the author of the Lunch Lady books, if you're not familiar. And the Lunch Lady books include a lunch lady who's a superhero and fights crime with tools like spatulas. Um, but he is visiting Pond Cove, and um, again, that funding's been provided by the Pond Cove Parents Association. And I think that's it. Good try, but you weren't quite as crisp as I was forced to be. I am sorry. <laughs> It's a long list. <laughs> Nothing going on. All right, don't, don't rest, though, um, because we go, we go right to item 5G, summer programming. Summer programming, yes. So as we have continued to look at the work of our mission and vision, and as some of these proficiency, the standards-based requirements have come into focus, we recognize that as a district, we have some work to do to make sure that all of our students are able to meet those standards. And for some students, we know that means more time. Um, for some students, that means having access to things in a slightly different way. But one of the ways we would like to try to increase, improve outcomes for all of our students is to offer some programming to our students in the summer. Um, we would be targeting students that we feel who would most benefit um, because we have limited funds available, but we would propose using some funds out of the current year budget. Um, we believe that we'll still be able to carry forward the proposed fund balance of 250 and yet be able to allocate um, some funds to support some summer work for um, students. Right now, our focus would be K-8 as funds become available. So I'm not asking for approval of that at this point, but I want to put it out there that we're developing that. We'd like to be able to share information with parents um, in the next few weeks in order to help them make decisions about whether or not their children are able to participate this summer. This summer. Good. Excellent idea. That's great. Yes, thank you, for, thank you for that. I'm excited about that. Yeah. Um, Piece, which is, I think, a very important part of closing the achievement gaps that we have looked at closely. Yes, and I, I mean, the reality is that for many of our students, that's a time when they lose some ground um, because they aren't having the regular practice with um, the mathematics or the reading or the writing, depending on whatever their, their area of need happens to be. And my understanding is many of the students who are most at risk of losing ground are the same students who are most at risk of struggling. And so if we can provide them with an opportunity to not to lose that ground, we go a long way. So. Absolutely. And it can be really fun. <laughs> 
so thank you for that. Now we move to item nine. Committee reports. Are there any committee chairs who would like to make a report at this hour? <laughs> no. No? Okay. I was joking. Yeah, yeah if you want. That's okay. Okay. Uh, item 10, school board agenda requests. Are there any agenda requests? If you don't have them now, you can always share them with Meredith or Elizabeth or myself at any other time. Item 11, uh, upcoming meetings. Other meetings to be announced? Meredith? Other, yes. Well, policy will be we'll meeting be Monday morning. Next week. 7.30. Mm -hmm. We'll be discussing, among other things, the substance abuse policy and with the advice or under counsel with Drummond and Woodson, which is pretty exciting. Um, negotiations will be meeting on Thursday. Thursday, 4 to 6. That was moved from tomorrow. Any other? Is it town council meeting next week? That is a week from tomorrow. A week from tomorrow. At 7. Right, yes. Michael? Yes. Where we present the budget to the town council. That's correct. Uh, the uh, Monday meeting um, is an opportunity for, I won't guess, I'll leave it. Um, it's public comment on the exactly. so, town council uh, budget. Is that just the town council budget? Yes. Because our budget will be, pre we present our budget to the town council on the 16th right. of April. And then the public hearing on that it's budget on is in uh, on the 17th. So. No, I believe it's on the 12th of May. So yes. Yeah. So the, the the board meeting uh, for the for our purposes tonight would be Wednesday. A uh, week from Wednesday, uh, Michael will be presenting the budget to the town council. Uh, I think it's always valuable to have school board members there in support of that presentation. Um, I know everybody's busy. And, uh, will you send us an email reminder? Sure. Those are helpful. Yes, Thank be happy you. to. Uh, are there any other announcements of, of upcoming meetings? No. OK. Item 12, may I have a motion? I move we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Seven. All right. Thank you, guys. Sorry.